Welcome to everyone who's joined. Just going to give it a couple minutes to allow everyone to join the webinar. See people are still joining, so just give them a little bit longer. Okay, we, um, we might make a start here. All right, so hello and welcome to today's um, ANZ PacBio Bioinformatics Workshop Series on Genome Assembly. We have another one of these planned for next week um, and that one focuses on genome annotation. So tune in for that. These workshops are brought to you by PacBio, Millennium and HRF. My name is David Hawkes. I'm the Brisbane Site Manager at the Australian Genome Research Facility. And importantly for this talk, I manage PacBio long read sequencing on the SQL2 instrument. PacBio long read sequencing, particularly HiFi sequencing, has been an incredible tool for several areas in genomics research. Arguably, the area that has seen the most adoption is in the generation of reference genomes. The combination of highly accurate and long reads with decent data outputs has opened up to de novo genome assembly like never before. And at AGRF, we've sequenced a growing number of Australian native plants and animals. Well, at least we've generated the long sequence data needed to assemble them. But after we've obsessed about how to get really high quality genomic DNA, how to build good libraries, sequence a few smart cells, generate subread data, convert that raw data to PyFi CCS reads, what next? What next is the question at the heart of today's seminar program. How do you take HiFi reads, generate a, a good contig assembly? What programs can you use? What if you want to phase contig assembly? What can you reasonably expect to generate and how easy it is it to do? And I'm really excited about today's panel. We'll try and answer these questions. So, just change the slide. So for the next two and a half hours or so, this is going to be our agenda. I'm going to begin with Paul from Millennium Science. who will give a brief overview of the chemistry and library prep behind HiFi data. Armed with this, we'll delve into the bioinformatics of genome assembly with Key Pin from PacBio. Following Key Pin, we have something really special. Heng Lee will be joining us all the way from Boston. Heng Lee is lead developer of a number of well known software applications, including Hi Fi ASM, as well as uh, and many other known, well known bioinformatics tools. Um, he'll talk about haplotype resolved genome assembly. Following that, I'll say a few words about what AGRF can offer to support genome assembly projects. And then Gareth, 
um, will dive into resources that are available through Biocons and Galaxy Australia that will help you with your genome assembly projects. Lastly, to round out the session, we have Carolyn Hogg, who will present her real world experiences with genome assembly from PacBio data. Finally, we'll end with an open panel discussion. Um, at the end of each talk, there'll be a brief couple of minutes for questions. We might do one or two. Um, I'd encourage you, if you do have questions, to type them into the chat. We'll try and triage them. Um, but we'll also open up the microphone uh, at, at the end if uh, you'd like to you know, speak your question as well. Um, I'm really excited for, for this, um, uh, this seminar series, so we'll get started. Um, our first speaker is Paul Gooding. I'll just stop my video here, stop sharing. And we'll start his slides, please. Paul, do you want to start? And I'll just introduce you. Sure thing. Um, so Paul is a, a, uh, is a UK import after completing his PhD at the John Innes Centre. His postdoctoral work was at Syro Plant Industry, where he focused on um, post-harvest quality fruits and vegetables. He then moved to the University of Adelaide to run their serial genetic transformation facility. He's worked for many years as a senior scientist at the Australian Genome Research Facility, running a suite of next gener generation sequencing machines and coordinating genotyping diversity profiling pro projects. Paul is the FAS at Millennium for Genomics Portfolios in ANZ and of particular interest for this talk, pack Sequencing. Paul will be giving us a brief summary of Hi-Fi Library Prep and Sequencing. Thank you, Paul. Well, thanks, David, and, uh, and thanks to all the panellists for being on and uh, for everyone that's joined. So, um, as David said, I'm Paul, I'm FAS with Millennium Science, and uh, we're just going to uh, skip through in the next sort of 10 minutes very briefly before we get into the bioinformatics of, of actually what is hi-fi data, how, how is that sort of generated from the sequencer, and also the key considerations for the whole genome sequencing sample prep and library prep, with both of which are these are key for getting good, good quality data. Um, so we'll just get into the, the, the first point um, and, and explain what HiFi is. Well, these are the molecules that you're essentially sequencing. So the, 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 the yellow and pink in the, in the middle um, is, is your, um, your unknown fragment, if you like, your piece of, of genome that you've, you've fragmented and, and, and uh, got to sequence. Um, so what you do is uh, you, you ligate on these so-called smart bell adapters. These are the pack bio um, uh, hairpin adapters um, that go on the end of, the, of, of your library fragments. And there's um, uh, a region there for, for the sequencing primer to bind. And then the polymerase is able to form that complex. And, uh, and that drives the, the sequencing engine, if you like. But um, though the, the, the molecule is essentially linear, it's, it's topologically circular. So you can imagine when the polymerase is on here and it starts to read, um, it's a little bit like a bicycle chain going going round and round and round. You're going to read along, say, the, the, the purple or you know, pinky purple strand here. It's going to go round a hairpin adapter. You're going to go the reverse complement of the yellow and then back round a hairpin adapter and round and round and round. We'll see that a little bit um, in a moment. But as you can see, um, because PacBio um, sequence is, is, is so long, you're able to go around these mo molecules multiple times. And, and, and that's what gives you the very, very high accuracy um, that we have from HiFi data. So what I've sort of tried to describe, you see going on in the little cartoon in the middle there. So um, we, we fragment our, 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 our high quality genomic DNA, um, say around 25 KB, or maybe a little bit smaller for some jobs, um, just depends on the applications. Um, but then that polymerase starts to, to turn into the sequencing engine and round and round and round it goes. So if you like uh, the panel on the right, um, what, what you've got is multiple passes along the same molecule. So as, as I said, you've got um, like a forward pass and then a hairpin and then a reverse complement um, and then a hairpin and so on and so forth. So I think there's about eight passes here in, in this particular um, um, uh, 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 example. So because you've got these multiple passes of the same molecule, um, and, and because the, the pack biosequencing technology itself is incredibly un, unbiased in the, in the way that it generates its sequence, really the only errors are random errors caused by the polymerase itself. And, and there's nothing you can do about that. Every polymerase is gonna make errors um, um, from time to time. But the great thing, because you've got all these passes, if you like these little errors are, are in red, um, if you imagined you had, a, say, a, a T here and the other seven calls were a G, 
you can essentially screen that out as a polymerase, random polymerase error, because you know it's the same molecule. Seven of the calls is G, it's going to be a G. So you effectively, you make this consensus sequence. And that's what hi-fi reads are. So you're, you're, you're taking these multiple passes, random molecule, um, making a, 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 a consensus sequence um, um, for your hi-fi data. You trim the, the, um, the hairpin adapter sequences off, uh, and you've got this, this hi-fi read. And it's incredibly accurate. Um, um, and because of the, the power of the uh, long sequencing technology, you can go around these molecules multiple times. So that's um, what HiFi is. Some people call it CCS or, or circular consensus sequencing, but HiFi is much easier to say, and I think what everybody kind of calls it. So HiFi data is that. Um, so uh, moving on to um, the other key consideration for, for getting good sequencing data, and, and, and that's um, sample prep and library prep. Now, I'm not going to go through these in huge detail because I don't have the time, but um, uh, I just want, want to, to say, I suppose it's the old adage in, in molecular biology, you know, sort of rubbish in, rubbish out. If, you, if the quality of your starting material is not good, it's very unlikely you're going to get really good quality sequencing data. And so we want to um, give you every um, best possible chance to, to, to get the best data you can. So um, it's a little bit wordy this slide, I apologize, but I'll go through it. Um, so your, your DNA extraction, your, um, your, your genomic DNA, it needs to be high molecular weight. This is this is long read sequencing. Um, so your, your starting material needs to be um, long, um, you know, ideally greater than 100 KB, the bigger, the better. Um, and you can see from the, um, the little um, picture of a, a pulse field gel um, on the right here, um, you've got uh, that sort of lane three, you've got some very nice high molecular weight DNA, uh, well over 150 KB. Um, and then um, uh, the last lane, not lane four, you can see some degradation and you see this, this classic sort of smear a little bit of a band that may be 30 kb but um, um this, this is not ideal um though you can perhaps work with it it's it's not going to be ideal for for, for um, your application here for, for whole genome sequencing so you want high molecular weight dna you want your dna free of degradation free of nicks and other dna damage okay um it also needs to be clean so highly pure um uh, uh classic problems that that we see um from blood extraction are carrier of, of heme, um, so we want to avoid that. We don't want any proteins or polysaccharides um, that, that, that can commonly come from your, your cellular um, debris. We don't want that in the sample. Um, we don't want phenolics. That's uh, a problem often with plant samples. Um, um, yeah, um, plant, plant tissues are often chock full of phenolics. Um, so we want to avoid those. And, and guanidine too, which is uh, um, one of the re um, reagents in a lot of the column-based um, DNA extraction kits. Um, we don't want any carrier over of that either. These are all very bad. So we, we need to make sure our samples are clean. You can get commercial kits um, specifically designed for high molecular weight DNA extraction that avoids vortexing your DNA and things like that. Anything that's going to cause damage, you can help yourself by using whiteboard tips and all that. Anything to try and keep your DNA high molecular weight and clean. Um, Anybody who's looking for protocols, um, there's uh, a great little um, website there called extractdna for pacbio.com. Um, and it's essentially an open resource that PacBio tried to keep up to date with um, publications from all sorts of plant and animal and bacterial virals um, samples. Um, anything that's been extracted and the extraction method used that, that, was, um, that, was, that was best for, for PacBio sequencing. So that's a really good resource. Uh, <clears throat> So once you've got your high quality um, DNA, um, uh, um you, you you really want to um, look after this and and, um, um, and and make sure that everything's good. So you need to do good QC. So um, uh, ideally for sizing, you're going to use a pulse field gel or, or field inversion gel or, or the femto pulse instrument. Very, very good for sizing high molecular weight DNA. Um, and, and the better that that DNA is to start with the longer your reads um, generally and the lower quality um, then obviously um, the shorter and uh, the reads and, and effectively the lower the high fi data yields you're going to produce. Um, and we'll move on to a couple of um, things about instruments that we can use for, um, for QCs. So um, for co um, constant, um, concentration measurement, um, we recommend using a qubit with a, it's a, a fluorimeter effectively. So it's a fluorescent assay <clears throat> and uh, a high sensitivity assay. It's going to measure specifically the double stranded DNA concentration in that solution. So um, <clears throat> it's a very accurate measure of, of, of your starting material. And that's important. Um, 
And the other thing you can do for look for quality um, is, is to use a spectrophotometer. Nanodrop is very, very common. Um, uh, and, and you're looking really for two things. You're looking for a 260 to 280 ratio, so between 182 and a 260 to 230 ratio of, of over two. Um, and uh, if you haven't got those, um, Pat Byer certainly recommends, and I would certainly recommend as FIS to customers um, to do um, uh, Ampure PB um, bead cleanup to try and get that, that sample as, 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 as clean as possible. The other thing that we look for is we, we, we want some um, uh, um, uh, similar values from, from the qubit and, and the nanodrop. So if, if these values are too far apart for measuring the DNA concentration, um, it suggests that there's a lot of contaminants um, in your sample. It could be RNA or nucleotides or phenolics or whatever else. So, so we want a convergence really between the qubit and, and the nanodrop data to get those as close as possible. The closer they are, most likely the cleaner it is and the better it will be. Now, I'm not going to go through the library prep because um, I don't have time. As I said, it's sort of um, shown on the left in a little box. Um, but as you can imagine, you've sheared your DNA. Uh, it's randomly sheared. Um, there's methods for doing that um, uh, with um, uh, mega ruptures and, and uh, Kavaris little G-tubes and all sorts of other things. Um, so there's protocols for that. But you end up with random ends that need to be, um, be tidied up and you end up with nicks and things in, in the DNA now. Um, the analogy here is, is the roads that I've, I've put up. You can imagine your polymerase needs to read through these molecules and, and the cleaner and better and, and, and free of damage it is, the better the polymerase is going to behave. It's like driving along this road on the right. It's really smooth. You can get your foot down, get up to speed, and it's a lovely, comfortable ride. The polymerase is going to stay on, on target, just like your car is going to stay on the road. On the left, however, if you've got some nicks and damage, uh, it's like driving over the potholes, right? You're going to have to slow down. It's going to change your local base rate, um, uh, as seen in the data. Uh, and the polymerase can, like your car, can just hit a pothole and fall off, right? It's going to stop sequencing. So you're going to get shorter read lengths and, and things like that. So um, uh, there's lots of um, repair steps in the library prep protocol, but it's important to, to obviously to follow those. But better still, if you've got higher quality input DNA that's with less damage, it's more likely that the these repair steps are going to be um, totally effective and you're going to have no damage at all. So, so that's important. And the, I suppose the last thing for getting really good quality um, data is to do some size selection um, of, of your library. So you really want all your library molecules to be in a very, very tight size range. Um, um, and the better we can do for that, um, um, the, the, the better the overall data quality at the end. Um, so there's, again, there's equipment to do this from Sage Science, their Pippin HT or their Blue Pippin system or the Sage Elf, um, uh, able to, to do very accurate size selection for your molecules. You certainly want to get rid of your short stuff. And um, because you're wanting to generate hi-fi data, you don't want the really, really super long pieces of DNA because you're not going to be able to read around those molecules multiple times so easily. So that's important to do. And as I say, this is a, a very general overview because I know you're all begging to get into bioinformatics analysis, but if we thought it was important to just try and present um, what's important uh, at the very beginning with your sample and your library in order to give yourselves the best chance of getting good quality data. And also, if you're looking at data and you see some problems with that data, to perhaps think why that problem may have occurred. Was it something about the quality of the starting genomic DNA? Was it something about your size selection, perhaps? Um, uh, you can start to troubleshoot. And, and, and of course, that's what we're here for, to help. Um, so if you ever come across these problems, reach out and, and we'll try and troubleshoot with you. So um, that's probably enough from me and um, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, hand back um, uh, control, I guess, to David. So um, thanks and enjoy the, the rest of your, of your webinar today. Thanks, Paul. That's great. Um, just quickly, um, is there any, any questions that we might sort of, um, uh, we'll, we'll ask, um, how about this one? Given the requirement for reasonable size inserts for hi-fi gen generation, is the requirement for very high molecular weight still a must? So, so I guess it's like you're you're only uh, looking at 15 kb. Do you still need 50 kb? Uh, I think that, that as I try to elucidate there, it's it's that you can still work with those samples, but because they're shorter, you've got damage. They've been broken to get short. Now there's 
the all probability that there's actually a lot of damage. So even the, the, the molecules that are still of a length, say 30 kb, um, they're probably peppered with nicks and, and all other sorts of problems. And this has, has implications downstream as, as I tried to show. So it's going to be more and more difficult to, to repair all of that DNA properly in order to, for the polymerase to, to fly along that smooth road, if you like. So um, that's what we're aiming for. So I would still recommend that um, even if you're going for, for, for fairly short inserts, the, the higher, higher, higher quality the, the starting material, the better, and you will um, reap the rewards in your data at the end. Um, one last one. Um, can we, can you use um, uh, pack biomagnetic beads for size selection? So. Interesting. Um, so it's the, the um, Ampure beads, the, the, the Ampure PB beads that I, I mentioned for cleanup. There are some protocols where um, you use those Ampure beads as a, as a size selection method. Um, it depends a little bit on the size of your inserts. Um, uh, for the whole genome sequencing, it's not the recommended way. Um, I guess you have to work with the best you've got, but um, ideally um, uh, a Pippin, you know, HT or, or Blue Pippin or, or something along those lines or, or, or the Sage is going to get you a much tighter distribution. It's very, very difficult with beads um, to, with those really high molecular weight fragments to, to accurately make a size cut. It's easier for very small molecules. You can get rid of stuff, say, below 2 or 3 kb, which is helpful. But to really make an accurate cut at say 15 or 20 KB, that's that's very difficult with beads. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate Pleasure. that. Um, all right. So our next speaker um, is uh, Ki Pin. Um, so Ki Pin completed his um, postdoctoral de degree in computational study of proteins. His research integrated genomics, transcript, transcriptomics. Um, and data to elucidate insight into the evolution and resistance mechanisms of cancer. Keepin is the FAS um, bioinformatics scientist at PacBio Asia Pacific. He brings a wealth of knowledge in long read bioinformatics. Today, he'll be talking about the technical details of genome assembly um, with, within SmartLink um, and, and more broadly as well. Um, his title is Bioinformatic Workflows for High Quality Genome Assembly. Thank you, Keep in. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I will share my screen. All right. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, for today's topic, I will be talking about bioinformatics workflow uh, for high quality genome assembly. So uh, thanks, uh, David, for the introduction. So um, <clears throat> I'm keeping, I'm uh, Field bioinformatics scientist with PacBio APAC. Um, so the agenda for my talk will be a quick, very quick introduction of HiFi Read. So this has um, been introduced by Paul just now as well. So I will not spend too much time on it. Um, and for the technical part, I will be going through with you an assembly and you know a scaffolding of the maze B73 genome, of which the HiFi data has um, is actually available publicly. So you can actually go through whatever that I will talk about in the slides um, on your own, if you are uh, interested to try this. So why HiFi genome assembly? So we typically talk about genome assembly uh, in, in the past in terms of 3C, which is the contiguity, completeness, as well as the correctness. Um, so when we talk about contiguity, we essentially refers to how continuous the assembly is um, is there any breakpoints or is there any um, other issues that cause the uh, assembly to break up? So ideally, you want your um, genome assembly to be in chromosomal level, you know, one chromosome in one continuous sequence, right? But that's um, in the ideal case. Um, when we talk about completeness, we are talking about um, are there any missing bases or any, any fragmented genes? So this is typically in terms of, you know, uh, Busco completeness, for example, which is the, uh, what you probably are familiar with. We also have correctness, which is talking about the base accuracy. So once you get a continuous sequence, are they actually accurate? So these three Cs are the uh, important metrics to look at genome assembly. But with HiFi assembly, we now also have another C, which is called compute. So altogether, this makes up four C. And compute refers to the time taken to actually go through the bioinformatics workflow to assemble a genome. So in the past, if you want to assemble a large genome, 
it might actually take days or weeks or even months. Now with HiFi Genome Assembly, it actually takes hours to assemble a genome. Think about the possibility of this where you can actually quickly generate genomes and perhaps if you have any issue, you can actually optimize it and regenerate it all within the span of hours. And in large projects, this allows you to actually focus on the downstream biology of what's important to study instead of um, spending time waiting for the genome assembly to finish. HiFi reads are um, transforming genomics in the sense that it has extraordinary accuracy. It provides even coverage across genome and it is highly complete and it provides the best performance to actually document, to actually characterize all variant classes, including SNPs, indels, and structural variants. So this was the re, um, result from the uh, Precision FDA challenge last year, where PacBio HiFi was crowned as the best technology for variant detection. Shown here is just an example of how accurate HiFi read is. Of a, for a 20 kilo base pair HiFi reads, the predicted QV is about QV33 which is 99.96% accurate. So you can see that there is only eight errors in this long stretch of sequence marked in the red arrows. We provide solutions for different DNA input quantities. So as Paul mentioned just now to you that, you know, for a standard hi-fi sequencing, um, we generally requires about five micrograms of DNA, but if you have lower amount of DNA and your genome size is not that big, we also provide protocols to actually work with those lower DNA input samples. Here are some of the large plant and animal initiatives across the world that's actually using hi-fi sequencing to generate high quality reference genomes. Some of these might look very familiar with you, to you, for example, the Darwin Tree of Life, the Earth Biogenome Projects, as well as the Vertebrate Genome Project. For, um, we, we have seen more and more publications coming out of the literatures in the recent years um, where PacBio is actually the core technology for many genome initiatives. Shown here is a very nice example of a recently published paper looking at gene annotations um, with long RNA reads, which is essentially um, PacBio um, isoseq. So for genome annotation, you can actually carry out isoform sequencing, which we will actually talk about next week as well. Um, and in this paper, for example, they actually assemble the genome and then use PacBio isoseq to actually characterize the transcriptome. And this actually allowed them to map a lot more single cell RNA reads in their single cell um, RNA-seq experiment. So as you can see here on the bottom right, um, the RNA-seq, the single cell RNA-seq reads in mapping rate increased by an average of 44% once they have a better transcriptomes using um, pack bio isoseq. For the data that I will be talking about today, we actually is actually part of this whole genome sequencing data. We call it the data noirs arc um, that pack bio actually sequence in house and provide to the public to actually try your hands on hi fi data. So we provide five species, which is um, M musculus, Z maize, um, uh, strawberry, or your rice a frog, which is uh, uh, R. muscosa, as well as a metagenome mock community standard, um, and they say 1003 samples. So these five samples have been sequenced with HiFi sequencing and are deposited on NCBI SRA. So you can actually download them and try your hand to assemble these genomes. So for today, we will be focusing on trying to assemble the Z-Maze. A typical assembly workflow um, requires you to have 10 to 15 fold hi fi coverage per haplotype. Now, this uh, also depends very highly on heterozygosity and repeats content. So, if you have prior knowledge on the heterozygosity as well as the repeats, you may want to consider increasing the high base hi fi coverage. Generally, for human, for example, even 20 fold hi fi coverage will provide you with a very good assembly. However, 30 fold would actually give you a much uh, even better assembly if you can actually increase your coverage. With some other species like plants, which is very complex, um, repeats contents might matter because if your repeats are actually long, you may want to consider increasing the insert size of your whole genome sequencing library so as to span over the repeats. In rice genome, for example, we have seen that 
the genome actually requires you to sequence to around 17 kilobase pack for it to actually generate very good assembly. We have three workflows, three, sorry, we have three general steps to actually run um, assembly workflow. The first of which is of course, CCS analysis. So this can be done using our CCS application, both in SmartLink and in command line. If you own, if you have a SQL 2E system that would generate it on instrument, but the data is actually identical to what you do on SmartLink as well as on command line. If you have barcodes, you will multiplex the barcodes. And next is actually the downstream analysis. For HiFi whole genome sequencing assembly, SmartLink provides an application called IPA, which is improved phased assembly, where it is a push button solution with just one click, you generate a complete de novo genome assembly. With third party tools, we have um, IPA is actually available on the, uh, as a command line tools as well, but there are now a lot of other third party tools that allows you to generate hi fi assembly, one of which is hi fi ASM, which Professor Haley will actually talk about it later as well. Um, so hi fi ASM has been uh, recently published and it is currently, it currently generates very high contiguity and accuracy. And I, I highly encourage you to actually look at this paper on the algorithm of how it works. And um, in, the, in the paper, it also compares against multiple assemblers. So for example, there was High Canoe, Peregrine, as well as our old favorite assembler, which is Falcon. And in this paper, you can see that High Fire ASM and High Canoe generates very high, very highly accurate um, assembly. They are pretty comparable with High Fire ASM having a slight edge and uh, Peregrine is not too far behind. HiFi can be used for polypoid genome assembly as well. For example, um, in recently there, has, there is a new paper published on assembling a common wheat cultivar builder. And this is a hexaploid genome, which is extremely huge at about 15 to um, 16 gigabase pair. In this paper, HiFi reads were used to generate um, a hexaploid genome with just 25 fold coverage and the assembly M50 was actually reaching 20.7 megabase pack. So this was really amazing and was, is traditionally probably unattainable without high fi reads. So I will now talk about some of the assembly tools recommendation. As I mentioned just now, my canoe is actually a very good assembler as well. However, um, high canoe actually requires quite a lot of compute resource. So um, if you have a lot of compute resource, you can consider actually trying high canoe as well. And the um, column compute here refers to whether you can actually scale the assemble across cluster or you can use it only on a single node. So HiFi ASM can only use a single node, but it actually performs extremely fast compared to other assemblers. And the output column here tells you whether you can generate a phase assembly or a collapse assembly. For the collapse assembly, you can actually uh, try to um, try to so-called unzip the assembly into two haplotypes later on with other tools. But for HiFi ASM, for example, the, it actually directly generates a phased output for you. So you, for a human, for example, a three gigabase genome, you will actually generate six gigabase of sequences using HiFi ASM. Peregrine uh, works on a single node. It's extremely fast as well, but it does require a lot of memory. IPA is PacBio's own assembly software. It can scale across faster and it is also extremely fast and it generates pretty good assembly as well. For IPA, we have seen that in some genomes that is moderately sized, it can actually provide um, the best results compared to other assemblers. So um, we recommend you to, again, you know, try multiple tools um, since the assembly is so fast. So uh, we have fly as well. And there was, there's a recent algorithm called MDBG that can actually assemble a single human genome in just 10 minutes. Of course, um, caveat supply. So right now it doesn't actually generate the best assembly, but it is exciting to see how um, algorithms is rapidly improving to take advantage of high fi reads. High fi reads can be used to carry out meta genome assembly as well. Um, and uh, one of the tools, so HiFi ASM, for example, has another version called HiFi ASM Meta that has been recently published in its preprint to actually generate a huge number of circular context directly for metagenome samples. 
and I highly encourage you to um, take a look at that paper as well to see the state of the art um, shotgun metagenomic assembly using hi fi. I will now go into MACE um, D73 assembly using the hi fi data that I talked about just now in the hi fi um, data NOAA's arc. So for MACE B73, this is a reference genome that has been sequenced in the uh, MACE uh, consortium. And they have recently, for example, published a de novo assembly annotation and comparative analysis of 26 diverse MACE genomes. There is a, a lot of data available on public for this particular genome. You can find HiC data, you can find Shari's data. And now with HiFi data, we are going to try our hand on assembling this. When you receive a set of HiFi reads, this is typically the data that you will see. So the processing report JSON file, uh, most of the JSON file gives you a brief overview matrix of uh, the assembly, for example, the number of reads, as well as the uh, number of reads that um, actually passes this uh, CCS filter. We, uh, the ZMW's JSON file actually gives you details for each DNA molecule that is sequenced in the instrument on whether they pass through the CCS filter or why they are actually being filtered out. So if you are interested to delve deeper into that, you can actually look at the ZMW's JSON. The XML file is actually uh, just a pointer file that tells you, for example, the experimental details, as well as the location of the band file. This is typically used to import a set of data into SmartLink if you want to carry out um, graphical user interface genome assembly. The three main files that is going to be used for assembly is what we call the hi-fi reads.bam file, hi-fi reads.fastA file, and hi-fi reads.fastQ file. So we provide three formats for you to use uh, for easier compatibility with any assemblers that you will be using. And the difference between reads.bam file and hi-fi reads.bam file is that hi-fi reads.bam file contains only reads that is above QV20, which is 99% accuracy. And these are the reads that is typically useful for genome assembly. Reads.bam file contains all reads regardless of the quality. So you can have CCS reads that's actually less than 99% accuracy, and they will be actually included in the reads.bam file. A characteristics of a good quality hi-fi data set would look something like this. So on the left here is um, a plot that is generated by SmartLink, where on the x-axis is the read length of the library. And on the y-axis is the predicted accuracy of each hi-fi read. As you can see, because of how smart sequencing works, the longer the reads are, the, less, um, the, uh, the, the lower the accuracy is. So when we prepare a library, library, for example, that is concentrated at about 15 KB, you should observe that most of the reads are above Q20, and in fact, on average, actually about 99% accuracy, which is Q30, at the read length, uh, at the insert length that was prepared for the sequencing. If you want to reproduce this plot on command line, you can actually go to this GitHub page, and there is a script to actually regenerate this plot um, using the R software. Pre-assembly tools, you, uh, sorry, pre-assembly, you can actually use tools such as genome scope to estimate genome heterozygosity, repeat content and size from sequencing reads using a KMER based statistical approach. Traditionally, with long read sequencing, you cannot actually use these tools because it requires very high accuracy to characterize the KMER. With high fi reads, it is now accurate enough that you can actually use these tools that was actually designed for short risk, short risk in the past and use high fi reads to directly estimate genome heterozygosity as well as the size and its repeat content. So for this maze, um, genome, for example, we were able to see that the haploid length is estimated to be about 1.8, which is close to two um, for uh, maze. And it tells you uh, roughly how many, how, what is the repeat length for this genome as well. Uh, shown below is the command that is used to generate this particular histogram. And you can use this as an example or go to the GitHub page for the software to actually look at how to generate this um, data. So um, with this genome, we will actually talk. So for, with SmartLink, it is a push button solution. You just click the button and you get it. You get your genome assembly. So for this particular session, I will talk about how to do it with command line with HiFi ESM. So HiFi ESM is actually a one 
line command as well, where you just put in the output name that you want, give it the number of um, CPUs that you have, and then feed the uh, fastq file to HiFi ESM. It is as simple as that. Once this tool is finished, it will generate a GFA format, which is a graph format for uh, sequence. If you want it in a conventional FASTA format, you, would, you can use tools such as GFA tools to convert the GFA file into FASTA file. The assembly output includes the UNITIC, which is the haplotype resolve uh, process UNITIC graph, the primary context, which is the assembly graph of primary context. So this is the traditional um, FASTA file that is used by many, that is output by many assemblers in the past. With HiFi ESM, it now generates two other um, haplotypes called HAPL HAP1 and HAP2. These two are actually partially phased contact graph of, um, of different haplotypes. Since um, these are phased based on the reads information, they are called partially phased um, because we don't, we, we will not be able, the limitation here is that we can only phase um, given the, the reads information, right? So um, this will generate two haplotypes which is, um, for example, if you have a diploid genome, you will, you will get uh, two haplotypes and there will be paternal and maternal haplotype switching simply because of the limitations of um, read-based facing. So um, in this Gmaze example, we have, we using HiFi data, we were able to generate assembly that is of excellent contiguity. As you can see, the M50 value here is 45 megabase pair. The QB values was actually quantified with short read sequencing data. I will talk about that in a bit, but you can see that the QB value is actually um, higher than um, the reference, which is the ZMAS uh, NAM 5.0 reference genome. And you can see the BUSCO score is very highly complete as well at 98% BUSCO completeness. You can see there is also a metric here called MMC, which is, uh, um, which is defined which is defining how good are the genomes resolving multi-copy genes. So for example, if you have a gene that is known to be multi-copy in a reference, if you have two or three copies. Now in your de novo genome assembly, did you, are you actually able to um, assemble it into the multi-copies? So this is traditionally very hard to do with noisy reads because without because these multi-copy genes are actually very similar to each other. And so you need very highly accurate reads for them to actually get assembled. And you can see that with, with uh, HiFi ASM and HiFi data, almost 90% of the genes um, that is meant to be multi-copy are actually multi-copy in the assembly. If you have high c data, you can now actually run HiFi ASM with um, using high c data to generate fully phased contact graph of hepatite 1 and 2. So this is very exciting because it now means that you can actually generate paternal and maternal haplotype directly using just high C reads. Traditionally, this is typically done with trio sequencing, but if you have high C sequencing, you can actually do that with just high C as well. And this is the commands that will actually take in um, the high C reads to generate a uh, uh, phase um, high fi ESM assembly. If you look at the high C phase um, HEP1 and high C phase HEP2 compared to the um, partially phase HEP1 and HEP2 just now, you can see that Generally, the um, QB score is higher and the BUSCO score is actually more complete as well. And of course, this will allow you to actually look at uh, paternal and maternal uh, haplotype information um, and tease about some of the most more complex alleles in your genomes. Sorry, I just want to emphasize as well that with high fi reads, we generally don't recommend polishing these days. But if you want, you can actually polish with Recon. And we have put in the number here just to show you that even if you polish the high five genome assembly, the gain is actually minimal. It's um, with primary contact, it increases by about one, but with the phase contact, it increases only by about 0 0.5. The risk of uh, polishing traditionally with short reads is that you risk actually removing some of the haplotypes information because, um, because it is not easy to actually map the reads. Um, so with high five, if you if you want to polish, we recommend polishing directly with high five reads, and we don't recommend polishing with short reads. So just to give you a sense of what the um, 
how the context looks like. If you generate only a single context, for example, you will see that there is a snip at one locus, for example. But if you look at the high fi reads, um, raw high fi reads, you can you will clearly see that there is actually a heterozygous um, SMD here. With phase context, you will you will now generate two sets of contexts, one with the snips, one without. And this is the power of um, high fi assembly, where you can actually resolve both the haplotypes of a genome if you have a deployed genome. How do you actually quantify the um, assembly accuracy um, with short reads data? So there is a tool called YAC, which is um, a short form for yet another camera analyzer. So this is also uh, by Professor Hengli. Um, and with YAC, you can actually take in short read sequencing data and use it, to quant and use it as kind of like a reference to quantify the accuracy of your genome. So shown here is a command, an example of the commands for the ZMAZE genome that we use. And once you generate the assembly QB value, you can look at the bottom here where the bottom of the file that outputs the QB score in two columns. So the first column is called raw quality value and the second column is the adjusted quality value. The adjusted quality value is actually used um, actually incorporates an empirical model because as the accuracy gets higher and higher, it's actually hard um, to quantify accurately. So in uh, YAC has a model, empirical model to actually adjust the values when um, the assembly quality values gets higher and higher. So it is actually more accurate. And this is the values that we typically report um, in literature. Next, we also have assembly stats, which is uh, the most common, um, the most commonly used tool to actually quantify genome completeness. Busco score allows you to actually look at some of the conserved autologous genes in different lineage. So for example, in ZMAZE, we will look at the embryo, embryo uh, phyta. And this contains about 1,600 genes that is conserved in this lineage. So if you have a good genome assembly, you should be able to assemble more, most of this um, conserved genes Conserve, uh, yeah, conserve genes in your genome, right? And so, for example, in the ZMAs genome, when we use the embryo phyta um, lineage um, autologous conserved genes, we were able to observe 98% completeness. So 90% of them are single copy, 9% of them are actually duplicated copies. That gives you a total of 98% completeness. So 98% of the conserved genes are actually assembled in the de novo genome assembly. Another way to quantify genome completeness is using ASMG, which is a tool by um, Professor Hengli as well. These two measure assembly completeness based on the transcriptomics data. So if you have a transcripts data from a public database, you can use it to quantify how complete, how many of these transcripts that is that has previously been characterized can be found in your genome. So this is another way to look at genome completeness. And with these tools, you also have, you will also be able to generate the information of MMC, which is what I mentioned just now, where if there is a gene that is actually multi-copy in the reference genome, how many of them are actually multi-copy in your de novo assembly? So here, for example, you can see that one, five, seven genes are actually multi-copy in the reference of which 142 is actually multi-copy in the genome assembly. So uh, again, shown below is the example of the command used. And you can see that with, um, with transcriptomics data, you will use the spliced um, parameter for Minimap2 to assemble the genome. If you have high C data, you can actually scaffold the genome assembly into um, highly complete chromosomal level assembly. And high C data can, be, can come from different um, companies, Face Genomics, Dovetail Genomics, and RMR Genomics are three of the main companies. There is two utilities that you can use to scaffold, for example, SALSA and 3D DNA. With SALSA, this is an example of how you actually scaffold the um, assembly. So you first map the um, you first map the high C data to the assembly with BWMM. And then you will actually use a tool called pair tools to actually pass the ligation events from your high C data. And this will generate a pass high C band file that you can use with SALSA to scaffold the long reads assemblies. So shown here is an example of using SALSA to scaffold um, uh, the assembly using the high C data. 
And with cell cell, you will also have to specify the restriction enzyme if there is any restriction enzyme used. Here's an example of a Zimase assembly using HiFi ESM and HiC. And you can see that the N50 value um, of the scaffold goes up to 180 megabase pair, which is essentially chromosomal level already. Because the assembly was high quality to start with, it is actually very easy to generate chromosomal level assembly. And if there is any small mistakes, it can be easily corrected post using um, manual curation as well. We use a tool called DGNIS to carry to generate a dot plot, which is essentially comparing our assembly to the public reference um, ZMAS B73 reference assembly. And you can see that um, if there is no grid line, it means that essentially the whole chromosome is actually assembled in a single contact after using uh, high C scaffolding. And you can see that most of the grids are actually complete genome assembly, which means that the scaffolding actually manages to um, put all the contacts into a single um, chromosome level across all chromosomes. Another tool such as uh, is Quas, where you can use it to actually look at uh, alignment blocks, which is what we call the NGA50. So whether your assembly can actually span continuously across the, um, the reference genomes, you can use Quas to actually quantify that. For structural variants, there is, um, there is multiple ways you can do this. Well, so one is the traditional reads base, which is biomapping the reads to uh, reference genomes to look up structural variants. But if you have genome assembly, you can actually take the genome assembly that you have, map it to a reference genome assembly, and, doc and characterize the structural variants in that. Assembly take is one such tool where it is a web server that is very easy to use. You will have to run um, Nutmer to actually generate a uh, alignment file of your assembly to the reference genome. And then you will use the output of these tools to actually identify this um, to actually, as an input to the web server of assembly ticks, and it will give identified um, complex structural variants for you. Another tool is actually SVIN ASM. So this will allow you to actually um, characterize the structural variants directly using the novo genome assembly as well. And shown here is the command um, line examples of how do you actually do this. Um, and on the website for SVASM, they have a documentation guide um, on the best way to do this as well. So why do you want to do assembly to assembly structural variants? That in some, for some very highly complicated um, structural variants, it is actually very hard to characterize with read-based structural variant too. So assembly. Um, allows you to actually characterize some of these very complicated uh, structural variants. And with SVIN ASM, it also allows you to carry out pairwise comparison of your genomes without using a reference genome. So let's say you have generated um, two haplotypes or you have generated two or three um, strains from the same species and you want to actually compare them against each other. You can actually do that with SVIN ASM. So finally, this is uh, if you have if you want to directly characterize with the reads without assembly, you can use our tool as PVSD. The advantage of a reads-based um, structural variant is that, is that it typically has very high sensitivity and specificity. And here, shown here is an example of um, using PVSD to characterize the structural variants in the CDMAS genome. And this, you can do this in SmartLink or you can do this on command line. So shown here below is actually the command line example of doing this with PVSV. But if you have SmartLink, you can actually use our push button solutions on SmartLink as well. Finally, for variance calling, we typically recommend using deep variance. This has comprehensive, this is comprehensive, and it has high sensitivity and specificity for both SNPs and indels. However, note that deep variance has traditionally been trained using machine learning on a human model. While it works, fairly well for non-model species, um, the performance is probably not as good as human. So this is something to keep in mind with. To summarize my talk, Quackbar high fi reads allows for hard, fast and complete assembly, very high contiguity assembly, extremely high accuracy as well. So this is typically the traditional 4C that we have. And finally, it helps you to resolve haplotypes. So for a 
for a human genome, it assembles a six gigabit genome. For a maze, it assembles a four gigabit genome. So this will allow you to have a much more complete picture of a genome compared to a traditional um, genome assembly. If you have complementary high C data, that will allow you to actually face the genome and provide you with chromosomal level scaffold as well. And I'll end my talk here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kipin. That was amazing. Very, very excellent. Um, just try and see if we've got any any questions for Kipin. Um, this one I can quick up pick up quickly. Um, uh, so one of the most recent ones after getting phased haplotype genomes by using HiFi ASM plus high C. Oh, it's an answer. Both data can be used for high C and scaffold. Oh yeah, so after getting the phase haplotype genomes using HiFi ASM plus HiC, can you use it again for HiC scaffolding? I guess that's basically the essence of that. Yes, indeed you can. So that, that is a possibility. So once you generate both the haplotypes, you can use the same HiC data that was used for HiFi ASM to actually scaffold both the haplotypes as well. Um, just uh, another one. Um, uh, we've got Yuki asking, I'm, I'm currently trying to learn how to use Minimap 2. Do you have a recommended online, online resource to learn how to use the tool? Um, is, that, is that something available through GitHub or, or how, how would you start to learn that? Yeah, Minimap 2 actually provides, um, Minimap 2 actually uh, provides a pretty, I think it's simple, pretty simple to use depending on data type, it's typically a one-line command. So if you go to the Minimap2 GitHub page, they will tell you, for example, if you're pack by HiFi data, this is the parameter that you use for, um, for um, you know, conventional long, long reach data, this is the parameter you use. If you have transcriptomics data, um, you would need to use the splice parameter. All those are actually documented on the GitHub page. Excellent. Um, just uh, in lieu of time, we might press on. Thank you so much, Keepin. That was a, a fantastic talk. All right. Um, so I'm actually very honored to introduce um, our next speaker, Professor Heng Lee, for today's talk on uh, genome assembly. Um, Heng Lee studies advanced computational algorithms to solve practical biological problems. He focuses on sequence alignment, variant calling, de novo assembly, data storage, storage and information query. Heng Lee has an incredibly impressive resume. resume. He's, he's, Began his research as a scientist at the Beijing Genomics Institute, working on the sequencing of rice, silkworm, and chicken. His postdoctoral research fellowship was performed with Richard Durbin at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. And during this time, among many other tools, he was the principal developer for SAM tools, the Burrow Wheeler Aligner, um, MAQ, TreeSoft, and TreeSAM, TreeFam. Heng Lee's papers on SAM tools and BWA have both been cited over 30,000 times at least. Um, he has also developed Minimap2, CK, and HiFi ASM. He has collaborated with multiple research groups, published on the analysis of single cell sequence data, chromosome confirmation, cancer genomics, population genetics, and species evolution. He currently holds positions at both the Dana Faber Cancer Institute and Harvard University. I'm very excited to hear Heng Lee's talk on haplotype resolved assembly of human genomes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. And uh, it's a great honor to present my work here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during the talk, I will, I mean, close my camera because I mean, my home network sometimes is faulty and so I will just stop the video. Uh, okay, today I'm going to talk about the haptop results of assembly of long accurate rates, mostly the, the high fi rates. Um, and so the role, I mean, most people know the role of the, the genome assembly. I think it's well known that uh, if we want to get the reference genome of a new species, we will do genome assembly. But the lesser known, I mean, role of the novel assembly is actually to call complex uh, variants. Uh, keeping actually talked about that, I will show you the example. I mean, why that's the case. And so in, in, in this, uh, this is the IGV screenshot. And uh, 
they said here is the, the, the human data that on top is the human chromosome, the reference genome. And then you can see the elimination cell read, the read mapping, and also the fi read, read, read mapping. Then on the top, uh, the top two track here, these two lines are the, the haploid uh, 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 phase uh, assembly. And you can see in, in this region, you don't really just see lots of gaps, but then you see huge piles of uh, shell rate right there. You don't really know what's happening. With the high fi rates is better. You can know that there's a copy number change because coverage has increased to this around 300 fold coverage. The, the average is only 30 fold coverage. And so no, something is going wrong, but don't know, really know what's going wrong. Then if you look at high fi assembly, you can see that actually what's actually happening is uh, the high fi goes through both of the parental habitats. So you see this, uh, actually there's a 30 KB insertion and here it is. In total, this is 60 KB insertion. In total, there's a 100 KB insertion. And there's also a lot, very long insertion on the other habitat. And so you know what's really happening here is actually this, uh, uh, not only the common number change, you know where this insertion happened and what's the, the lens. I mean, instead of just, and you also get, you got facing information. Instead of, I mean, just seeing a whole huge power of red face. And so here is the second example. There's also a human gene, the GTF2IRD2 gene. And uh, if you look at the read alignment on, at the bottom, you, you see there's actually, the, the, there's a very few reads matter here. There's long gaps. Uh, what's happening here is that there is another prologous gene downstream to, to, to this gene, so somewhere around here. Then, um, but that's really, really, really uh, during, possibly during, due to uh, gene conversions. And most of the reads coming from, I mean, sequence from this gene are actually mapped, to, mapped there. And without the assembly, you will see that this guy gaps. But if you look at the habitat result of assembly, you can see actually the, you, you see a whole county, megabase long county going through the, 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 this region. And also you can see start to see, you can see the here that I got here. I mean, you, yeah, it's a full, fully result of this region. This is another example. I mean, this, uh, the uh, long read assembly can resolve things that you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to, to solve just with uh, read mapping. And the question is uh, how many, I mean, how many of the such sequences are, are there? If you just look at just by count, it's actually mostly, most of these uh, compound variants, I mean, the concentration is really here. If you look at the, just by count, actually there's not so many, many, just a few percent of total structural variations in the human, human genome. However, if you sum over the length, if you look at the length, it was a length, I mean, the, the reference lines affected by, by, by this block is actually, you, you see a huge pipe here, mostly on, on this green region. There are tens of mag-based mag regions affected by uh, the, these uh, uh, complex genes. There are a few, several hundred complex genes affected by, by this. And these genes are often medically important, also evolutionally important, like the RPA gene I showed just, just now. And also the, the genes affecting the, the immunity and also uh, the uh, all the, the, the complicated genes, uh, like the, uh, affecting the brain functions, the amylase genes and the uh, rapid uh, 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 selection are all in this category. And so if you want to study this, this gene, actually this, this assembly is bad for, I mean, actually you wouldn't do much with it, just the, the real I think. And so because the, the, the power of this, uh, 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 high, 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 basically, high fat assembly, especially the high fat resolved assembly, the genome in the bottle, this, uh, the leading group doing this benchmarking work, the human variants benchmarking, they cho basically choose uh, the high fat SM as the baseline uh, choose. There are still I mean, small things, small errors in, in the uh, assembly, but they, they do manual curation. But for a large part, they basically they take this as, as the workaround choose. And this is saying that they are using this because it has higher power than the typical read read mapping approach. And in, in, in here, you can see this, uh, there are older benchmark read read regions. You can see that fragmented, there's a gaps, even a gaps on axons. But if you look at the assembly, there's no, 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 no gap, just uh, two contexts through the whole region. Okay, uh, come back to the, uh, the type of the, the, the assemblies. Um, in, uh, more, more focusing on the deploy samples. And so on the top two track, that this is uh, here. This uh, this is the deep human assembly. I think uh, this is the each red dot it means a, a maternal allele, and the blue dot means a paternal allele. But then here that just like show the here that allele. And the traditional assemblers, um, I would say that most of the assemblers would give you an assembly like this. This uh, is basically having this uh, 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 parental alleles randomly switching. I also quickly switching, rapidly switching in on, on this context. 
And the most examiner produced this, this basically lose almost all the phasing information in this assembly. And then in 2006, Jason, uh, at that time, he was at uh, Pegabar as well. He developed this Falcon zip, uh, and zip. Although there are still, I mean, I facing errors, you, you can see the, from the maternal allele switch to the, the paternal allele, but it's much less frequent. You get kilo, for, for the human genome, you get uh, 100 kilobits long uh, phase of bulk in, in it. But one problem with this, this approach is that, I mean, the, although you get one habitat, but the other habitat is fragmented. You can see the, the, the broken into short, short fragments. And so again, Jason, in two, last year, uh, it, he uh, divided that in paragraph. They said they, they, he can get two, maybe it's effectively this a pair of primary uh, assembly. Uh, you, you, you can see here. I mean, there's a, uh, there are still occasional switching errors, but uh, the, the, the switch happens much less often in comparison to a phase, a phase assembly. And then the top quality assembly is you don't get, get phase errors. And uh, you can do the view trail, this trail, or with this high C or other technologies. And I'll show you this uh, uh, part to show the difference between the, uh, the different type of assemblies. And uh, I will show, first show you the, the primary alternate pair of the assembly. And in, in this, uh, okay, on the x-axis, this is the number of paternal cameras, paternal specific cameras, the cameras you only see in paternal genome. And then on the y-axis is the maternal specific cameras, and uh, this is the, the number. And so uh, if the county are, are longer, they tend to have more cameras. And so the dots here will, will be the longer. For example, this long county, these are short, short counties. And the, the red triangle shows the, uh, the primary assembly. You can see they are long, yeah, they have lots of cameras. But, the, but these counties have both maternal components and the paternal components. Basically, they are mixing the, the, the facing information in the context. And if you look at the alternate uh, context, you can see that, I mean, they are, they are all very short, very short. Although they, they have the, their face correct, they have the facing information, but they, they are very short in comparison to, to this long uh, uh, primary context. And they're the same to, to Hakanu, they it has the same issue. And uh, if you look at this uh, dual zombie or partially phased zombie, the result would, would look like this. See, see this plot? This is a HEP1, HEP2 that, that uh, Kipin showed, showed earlier. Uh, these are partially phased. We call it partially phased because, I mean, they, have, they also have both per, uh, paternal and maternal components. They are very long. You can see the length is about the same as the, 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 the primary contact. They are, they are very long, but uh, they are mixing the, the, the phase. phase. And if you look at, if you use the uh, trio information, you can fully separate the, the paternal and the maternal habitat. You can see that all the paternal, all the father counties are, are here, all the mother counties are, are here. And if you, you are doing, uh, doing the, the habitat result as only with high C, you don't see any mixture here, basically there's no doubts in, in, in this area. However, because I mean, in the cell, you can't really distinguish, I mean, fathers, Father chromosome, which chromosome come from father, which chromosome come from mother, there's still no way to, to tell. And so you would see, you, you will see is uh, it's actually the partition will mix uh, paternal and maternal counties. However, these counties are phase correct. Each context is coming from a single parental genome, not, com not a main picture of them. These are the main major difference between these uh, different type of uh, phase, phase assembly. Um, and so these are uh, the phase, phase, um, phase assembly it's actually quite a new thing. Uh, if you think about the assembly as a problem, actually the, the assembly problem started, I think, in 1979. That's uh, almost uh, 30 years, years, years ago, people started to assembly. But uh, the face assembly is only, it's a very, very recent thing. That's, uh, I think, uh, the first uh, uh, phase uh, assembly that happened in 2018. At that time, people, uh, the the NGRI group, Adam Philippi, are using the trio binning, using the, the parental information to do the uh, assembly. However, at that time, the county is very short, only one megabase. And uh, uh, the key registration that we couldn't uh, achieve that high accuracy, and also there's a lot of facing errors in this assembly. The key reason we couldn't achieve that high accuracy uh, to, uh, in this phase, phase assembly, mostly because the, the, the low signal to noise ratio. They said they hear the, the noise is the things and errors. At that time, they, they were using Pegbell uh, continuous arrays, CR arrays, and the error rate is around 10%. But the human heterozygosity is only 0.1%, which means the, this error rate is actually 100 times higher than the, the heterozygosity. You are looking for this 1% uh, of the, 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 
I mean, one percent of the the actually the, the difference are, are really really huge. Like the rest, ninety nine percent are actually not noises. This may make it very difficult to, to do to do the the phasing. But uh, as uh, uh, King has shown and other has shown, I mean, the tech bell. This is I I actually call it a, a, a game changer every five years. You can see that these uh, elimination rates they are short and uh, and uh, they are accurate and there's a noise along rate they are long but uh, they are error rate much higher is around ten percent and the high rate basically effectively combines the accuracy of elimination rates and noise along long rates and actually many people may, may think that uh, I mean this may not be a big uh, I mean a, a big change but actually in, in, in fact uh, this actually makes a zombie a lot e e easier and uh, greatly increase the power of of a zombie. And uh, currently, most of the center assemblers are not making full use of the, uh, the accuracy. There are only, so far, there are only a few assemblers can do that, uh, like uh, HFSM and HFSM, Hakanu, and also IPA. I think these are, these are the, the only three assemblers, the practical assemblers that can really, really give you the assembly. And so uh, at that time, I mean, when we start to think about it, this problem, there were no HFA specific assemblers. That, that's why we, we developed this HFSM. Uh, is published in Nature earlier this, 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 Nature Methods uh, earlier this year, and all um, the the step is to doing the overlapping to find the the overlap between all reads, and then it does face a very rare error correction. Although hyper reads is it's uh, the error rate is very low, but we want to make the error free such that we can distinguish any I mean even a single hero that I go to we, we can we can separate the, the, this uh, this single hero that I go to. so we want the essential error free read that's why we still do error correction and after the error correction we do the layout I mean this is more like the the, the, the typical uh, example I will I will come, come to that and so about how 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 aware error correction this uh, phase aware phase when we do the error correction we don't we want to keep the hero that goes we want to keep all the hero together so rather than I mean cutting them away. With I mean a standard method, actually we would uh, correct away uh, 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 hero, real hero hero that goes. And so here, um, uh, uh, in this example, this uh, the, the black one. Each bar is a rate. It's long long. It's high five rate. And the back rate is a target rate. We want to correct this this, this rate. And how do we correct it? And we align all the other rates uh, uh, against the, the target rates. And uh, on this, uh, for example, at this column, you can see there's a the, this uh, red view are supported by three other rates, by three uh, red rates. And uh, this blue allele three support, are supported by three uh, blue rates. And in this case, we call this uh, informed size. These sides are like the uh, heterozygous or prodigious uh, difference. And so we trust the, this side. And, uh, and then we, and then now we see that the black rate has a red, red allele. Let me know the, the black rate should be grouped be grouped with these uh, red, red, red rates. And then we only use the red rate to do the error correction. We ignore the, the blue rates. And then now here, we have the, the red rate all the one base. The target rate has another base. And so this like the signal error, we will correct it this way. And uh, similarly, we, we can do, do, do I mean, this, uh, we, 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 do, we, go, we do this for, for error rates in, in, in the pool. And uh, about the, the layout, how the, some, the, the method works, I will just um, briefly go, go, go through it. I mean, this uh, the high assembly, assembly the, the layout step. And in this example, there are 10 reads, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, to, uh, all the way to 10. And here is a heterozygous allele. Say this uh, this maternal allele, this, the, the, the red one is a maternal allele, and the green one is paternal uh, allele. And so I will show how the uh, assembly work to keep the, the heterozygous information. And so this uh, now I mean change still the same same the same the, the, I mean we will use this circled number for each read the read, read number one read number two read num number three and uh, uh, we can uh, we basically if there's an overlap between read one and read two we add the edge this is uh, the representing an overlap and here is an uh, read two and read three that's overlap overlap and so we add uh, add uh, or add these edges. And we can see that there are some areas about it. It is because of, because if you know read one and read two have overlap and read two and read three and overlap, based on the overlap lines, you can infer that read one and read three has an overlap. In some way, these uh, dotted lines are sort of redundant uh, to, to, to the zombie. And so you can you can get rid, rid, rid of them. And this step is called the treatment reduction. And you, you, you can get rid of this and this graph becomes simpler. And also you see that so one, two, three, four, 
actually you can merge them. You can unambiguously merge all these more, all, 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 no, no together. Then you will get that your unity. It's called the unity uh, construction. And then you will get, you, you will left with uh, four unities. And starting from this to the end, it's more like this. You start with 10 rays, you end up with these four unities. And you can see this, uh, the redundancy tendencies are mostly collapsed. And, uh, but the, the heterodiversity information are kept in this graph. This is, uh, and uh, we can only do, do this with uh, essential error free rates. If there are errors, then we won't be able to tell whether these are errors or things I mean, whether these are things errors or real kilo that goes, we, we, we would make any mistakes. That's the importance of uh, uh, face of error, error correction. And uh, after, we, we, after we come to, 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 to this step, we can only use this, this method to face low, local information. And suppose uh, here, if we, we run that algorithm, we will end up with a, a graph like this on, on top uh, like this. Basically this, uh, we can, sometimes we can face two here that were together. Sometimes we can even face longer, more here that, that were together. But if there are no rate bridging these two here that goes, we wouldn't be able to face through so, so these restrictions. And for the dual or the partial, uh, partially re -re -re resolved, uh, partially re resolved, uh, half of re resolved assemblies, we uh, partially phased assembly, we would just randomly pair the data together. But if we have more information, for example, the trio information or the high CM information, we can create long range the linking thing. We can actually we can link them together. And here, this uh, subgraph, this is a real graph real human graph on uh, human uh, chromosome one uh, around 11 megabits. And uh, there's a two megabits region and this shows the assembly graph. And each this uh, bar here is, uh, is equivalent to, equivalent to a, I mean, a long unit here. And uh, there's a connection representing the overlap between the, the, these your units. And the color indicating because here we, are, we are have the parental information. And so we can use the parent data, data to tag to label the, 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 this unity to, to know, I mean, better this is some, the paternal unity or paternal unity. And so after the, after the, the labeling, actually, if you want to assemble the maternal gene, it's very clear, it's just trace this uh, red line, you get the, the paternal uh, uh, contact, that's two megabits uh, maternal contact. And then you, you trace the blue line, you, you get the two megabits long. A paternal quantity. This is uh, basically how the hyperlink works and how hyperlink re resolves the, the facing information and it still gives a lot of context. And uh, uh, I want to mention that uh, actually um, it's uh, the hyperlink is not only a better face assembly. Actually, if you can do face assembly well, you can actually get better hyperlink assembly. And in some way, if you think about that, it's actually for facing, for, for to do face assembly, you need to distinguish hypertypes based on very, I mean, very low, low heterodiversity, the 0.1% for, for, for human data, for other species is still around 1%. And the thing about if, uh, if you want to resolve signal duplications, it's actually, it's the same problem. I mean, the, 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 signal, the COVID uh, in the signal duplication can also be very close. And you he, see here is a example. This is a true habit. This is a hyper genome, not a uh, not a, a deep genome anymore. And this blue, long blue arrows and this uh, purple arrows, these are unique regions that are very easy to assemble. Uh, assemble. Then there's a duplicated copies here, the uh, power regions. You can see two copies here, but due to the evolution, there can be, when gradually they will accumulate a mutation like, uh, like this uh, greenish bar. It, there will be, be uh, mutations. And so the two copies are not identical. They are similar, but not, not, not identical. They are similar to the two habitat in, in the deep RHG genome. And uh, if the assembler can do a good job, it can do face assembly well, it's actually, it have a, to have assembly is just use the same algorithm to re resolve the difference between the copies. And it can assemble through it. But however, with a more traditional uh, assembler, if it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it cannot distinguish habitats, and it cannot, probably it cannot distinguish the two copies here. And so the end result would be one of these two, two cases. The first is that you get a, a, a misassembly. They say you only get one copy, you still assemble through it, you still get a long counting, but it's wrong. Or a second, it's not a mistake, but you can't assemble through it, and 
the example uh, sees something wrong, but uh, it can't re resolve copy the basis stop here. It then it generates a second count counting. In this case, I mean, you, you actually did counting it become short shorter. You, you have to choose, even choose one of these case. A bit high as um, hacker new IPA, he can jump through it. L lots of the district region that would fail uh, other uh, numbers. Um, here, the, here are the, 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 uh, the, the, the registration results of the, this assembly. And uh, uh, Kipin has showed this, uh, the, the Pac-Bell have this amazing data set, this mouse, maize, strawberry, and, and, and frog. You can see uh, for all these uh, assemblies, I mean, have time actually gives the long the context. And this also showing the, the red wood genome, although it's still short, but remember the 35 gigabits. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, am I good here? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, no, thank, thank you. Um, uh, and then the, this uh, the 35 gig gigabits uh, gig genome. Although the, the counties are really short, but remember that this is a uh, uh, this the much harder to assemble. And for human, the, the data mostly because data data better and how of higher coverage, and you can see we can assemble much better uh, gig genome. And then uh, keeping uh, uh, talked about uh, this uh, MMC the the percent multi copy genes that are missing in in, in the assembly. Basically, it's a uh, uh, the smaller the data better, the basically a large number of meaning errors. Is how many how many model how copy genes are, are lost in in here that uh, here uh, assembly and because I show show the example here, and so we can, if you look at the the raw the, the real data data is it looks something like this. If you look at the other examples also using the other data data, actually they would miss thirty percent even seventy percent of model copy genes. If the, if your gene had model copy, they would either I mean either this two case make a misassembly, or I mean uh, create create a assembly gap. In either case, I mean you you lose the the, the two one of the co copies. You only assemble one copy. You can see actually some assembly miss lots of them. But if we look at HPSM and Hakanu, they actually they, they miss only less than one percent of the, 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 these genes. They really construct most of the, the, the genes both fully, fully. This is the power power. This uh the HPSM Hakanu and MPA can can do the same. And uh, that, that's uh, what was on the homozygous uh, uh, T2T uh, telomere to telomere uh, CM13 assembly. Uh, so we know the ground truth. When we don't know, know the ground truth, we can still do similar evaluations. But if, I mean, you don't see this, uh, the, the, error, this the error rate is, uh, is uh, 10%, but it's it mostly most due to the, the sample structural variations. That's not, not due to the error. But you can see this is still much higher. Than, than the others. I mean, they, these have 80, even 90% of them. They collapse all these uh, uh, multi copy genes. But, 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 but better deploy assembly means a uh, better uh, 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 resolution. And uh, currently, this uh, HPSM is the assembly of a choice by the human panel project. A human panel project is using HPSM to, to assemble all these. Uh, this data, you can see the N50 all around this phase uh, parental, the trio assembly all around 50 megabits, some even, um, I mean, 80 megabits. Although I, actually, I'm always a bit, I haven't looked, at, looked into this assembly. Uh, I'm actually a bit skeptical if there's any errors though. And the, the, the above are mostly about the, the, the trio phasing. And uh, actually, we, we, this is we can, uh, uh, earlier we we published in Nature Biotech this uh, about how to use high C to, to re resolve assembly, and now we integrate a actually a better algorithm in into the HPSM. This our new preprint is currently in, in peer re review, and we can achieve this similar similar hyper resolve assembly. And uh, uh, keeping outside, I mean we do uh, the, we do managing assembly. You can just show in the assembly graph. You can just see the, the read the, the circle. There are. Uh, in this graph, there are more than 100 one megabits along, one megabits or longer than the circle. This is a circle is a complete uh, digital. So I will uh, summarize here is a, uh, I think the quality of the hyper assembly is unprecedented. I don't think anyone has ever achieved that before. And uh, you may heard about the human telomere to telomere project and uh, HiFi is the main data source. Although they are using other technology, I mean, other data, data types, and Nanopore is still very helpful, but they build the initial assembly with HiFi. Without HiFi, they wouldn't be able to do that. 
and uh, and uh, hyper SM is a uh, is a good hyper uh, sampler. I would say, but not too bad for sampler new new species. And currently, the, the only one that uh, can and can do this full can fully use high C information and fully use trail information to to do the, the assembly. And I want to also comment that uh, this uh, hyper assembly is by the face hyper assembly is the ultimate solution to a calling. You can call all kinds of uh, difficult uh, regression that would uh, communicate uh, the refit mapping based my methods. And at last, I want to thank my I mean, my team. How you turn is uh, the key. HyperSM developer and Sean is uh, doing this hyper meta meta genome assembly. I work with uh, multiple others and uh, also you know, panel projects, and they have all have helped me to develop this uh, algorithm. Thank you, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. That that was an amazing talk. Um, excellent. So, uh, do we have any questions coming in for Hang Lee? Let's have a look. Um, Ah, so uh, James is asking, are there opportunities to make Hi-Fi ASM even faster in the future? Mm, currently, uh, performance hasn't been our full focus. We have still have focusing on uh, basically improve. We, we think there may still room for improvement, basically improve the contiguity and reducing errors. Currently, that, that's our focus. I think in theory, uh, how you is actually thinking about how to make, make it faster, but currently it is uh, not our high priority. Such a high priority. Um, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear that um, uh, the power of using TRIO data. Um, could you uh, comment on um, when you, the differences you might see with using, say, high c data and Omni-C data? Is that roughly equivalent in your experience or is one um, showing more performance than the other? Uh, high C or, or, or Omni C, they, they are about the same. I mean, they, these two data are about, same. about the same. I think trail. I so far we still get better assembly with trail. I mean, high yeah. C assembly is uh, quite challenging. I mean, although I think uh, we get the best results also so far, but I think that if you have trail, trail will still do slightly better than than high C. So if you have the budget for it, trio data is, is the yeah, is and also the I mean you have the trio sample. Sometimes it's difficult to obtain the the, the parents. Uh, Gareth is just commenting on speed of Hi-Fi SM, which is uh, quite quite considerable. Um, we had a question that, that came in a little bit earlier on, and I'm not sure if uh, this is something that you can answer, Heng Lee. Um, what is your opinion on using the assembly metric LTR index or LIA? Um, it's a LTR retrotransposons uh, based assembly index. Um, I'm not familiar with that, sorry. Yeah, not either. Um, maybe we'll keep that in the questions and um, if sure. anyone else is able to answer, we'll, we'll put an answer into that one. Um, what have we got? Um, if haplotypes in the samples are not 50%, what ratio will still be resolved? I forgot that question right. If haplotype in the samples are not 50%, what ratio will still be resolved? Fifty uh, percent. Do you mean this? Uh, say sex chromosome. They are. I mean. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure. Clarify that. Maybe we'll hold that question over as well, and we'll, we'll answer it in the in the panel at the end. Yeah. Um, anyway, Hengli, thank you. Thanks so much for for your presentation. Um, we'll move on um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for you at the end of the end of the session. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen again. Um, sorry. Yeah. All right, so I'll just pref quickly um, uh, cover off uh, just a brief announcement from AGRF. So for those of you who work with AGRF, you'll already know that we provide subread data and CCS data and some metrics about how the runs have gone. Um, we've so far left assembly to, to be handled by the client. Um, and we've been a bit cautious about uh, getting into assembly side of things based on our experiences with short read assembly. However, however as you've heard from our previous speakers, 
Long lead assembly on the pack bow is quite mature now and has been for some time. So I'm pleased to announce that ADRF uh, will now offer um, genome assembly using um, uh, IPA that's been built into SmartLink 10.1. IPA is fast, it scales really well on the cluster and produces contiguous as assemblies. And it's suitable for genomes of, of nearly any size. Um, as mentioned, it does have the ability to separate haplotypes during assembly. Um, and so it, it's a fairly robust one that, that we're um, happy to start offering. Um, for any assemblies that, that we do generate at AGRF, um, we do look at completeness and we'll include a BUSCO score um, summary as well. Um, of course, for those of you wondering, we are looking at HiFi ASM as well. Um, it, it's very, um, as you've heard, it's a very um, good assembler and, and includes flexibility to include high c or Omni-C data into your assemblies. Um, that's something that's coming soon. So for some of you, we hope this will be an attractive option. Um, many of you, however, will want to get your own hands dirty into the genome assembly yourself. Um, perhaps you want to tinker with some of the parameters. Perhaps you want to try different assemblers. Um, and uh, one of the options you might use if, you, if you're trying to um, get into doing um, genome assembly yourself is to use the Galaxy platform, um, which leads in nicely into Gareth's talk. Um, so I'll just sort of stop sharing my slides now and load up Gareth's first slide. Um, and I'll just introduce. So, um, Gareth is uh, Gareth um, heads uh, the computational um, biology of QCIF, a facility for advanced bioinformatics. Um, Gareth has 20 years of experience as a bioinformatician and genomic scientist. His expertise spans experimental design, assay performance, data QC, data analysis, and data interpretation involving a variety of model organisms from microorganisms, fruit flies, mice to humans, as well as non-model organisms. Um, with lim limited um, genome information. Um, he is also the service manager for Galaxy Australia. Um, today, we'll be talking about um, biocommons and the Galaxy resources and how these can be applied to genome assembly. I'll let Gareth go forward. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'll just do the really obvious Zoom thing. One, you can hear me. Two, you can see my screen. You assume yes and yes. Um, so I've got the privilege of talking to you about, uh, well, I'll use a, a, a emotive word at the start, a free service to all Australian researchers. What this actually is, is a nationally funded service, which is free for researchers to use under the, the basis that uh, if we build it, they will come and if we build it, it will be used and uh, it will reduce the hurdle for researchers to do uh, their computational analysis. It's a two-phase talk. I'm going to talk about the biocommons at a high level and then dive a little bit more into Galaxy Australia. So the Australian biocommons lifted straight from their website. Their aim is to enhance Australia's digital life science research through world-class collaborative distributed infrastructure, uh, which is quite a convoluted statement in many ways. What it is about is about building those resources that we understand the Australian researchers need. For more information, the slides will be shared. Please go to biocommons.org.au. By example, uh, Biocommons growing a suite of tools and shown here are their sort of mature, currently discoverable tools uh, enabled through Biocommons or their partners. And I'll show the partners in a minute. So we start with the BioPlatforms Australia data portal, which is a repository for sequencing data, uh, including metadata as well, which can be shared and analysed uh, in a well-controlled and secure mechanism. BioCommons has built uh, two tools to link together, a tool finder and a workflow finder. And the idea behind this is for many researchers, part of the inertia is actually discovering uh, how, what tool you might need. Uh, then the next question is often, where can I run that tool? And then the third natural follow-on from that is, now I have a series of tools, how can I chain them together into a workflow or pipeline? I'll show you some screenshots of this in a minute. The majority of the time, I'm going to talk about Galaxy Australia, which is our web accessible platform, 
that allows you to access to those tools to conduct your reproducible and transparent research. And the final tool, which again I'll show in screen grabs, is a Apollo service. This is a web accessible platform to allow a genome annotation in a collaborative manner and a really wonderful service. So all these are accessible to Australian researchers. So a couple of screenshots, the data portal show you just a limited number of many of the projects that are involved there, threatened species and reptiles and genome of Australian plants. They happen to be the top three on the list. I didn't Photoshop that. And Galaxy has uh, analyzed data from all those three projects thus far. The tool and workflow finder, is accessible on a GitHub page, but also through the BioCommons landing page. And this screenshot here is really to show you what you'll get. So you'll get primary links to the tools, a description of the tool, the topics or the EDEM topics and the ontology that they support. Uh, are they self-installable in biocontainers? Are they av available to be downloaded for any Galaxy service? Are they available on Galaxy? or are they installed on our national um, compute infrastructures? And this list obviously goes on a lot longer than I've shown here, but a really wonderful place to come and find uh, where you might run or access a computational tool. Skipping over to Galaxy, because like I said, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on that. Apollo service, for those who are not aware, it is a JBrowse uh, interface that allows you to interact with multiple levels of genic information and evidence for that gene built along a uh, scaffold backbone and for manual curation of those gene products. So you can bring in gene prediction models, you can talk to your colleagues, you can overlay RNA-seq data, and you can, uh, as it's said earlier, curate and collaboratively build an annotation service, uh, annotation for your genome. Uh, get on to the Apollo portal, genome.edu.au, if this is of interest to you. And currently, we're hosting about 15 different large domains of genome annotation service, and we're expecting that to grow as more and more groups are aware of the service. Uh, Biocommons also uh, are regularly host webinars on how to perform bioinformatics, uh, what tools are involved, or what communities uh, are using their resources. So not surprisingly, they have a YouTube channel. You don't need to remember that whole URL, just by Google Australian Biocommons YouTube channel, and all of their webinars are there for watching, and that's a great resource. And the last slide on the BioCommons is just uh, if you're one, from one of these organisations or working with them, this is all the collective effort that goes into delivering those products under the BioCommons banner. Now I'm going to switch tack and talk about one of those platforms in particular. And this is one that I'm uh, very well aware of. I'm service manager of Galaxy Australia and I have been in this role for over three years now. I can read out the proforma at the top. It's a hosted web accessible platform that allows you to conduct accessible, reproducible and transparent computational biology research. Which is a little wordy, so let's dive into what it means. Well, at the surface of it, it's a website. But really that is just the interface to a huge number of backend resources, huge number of tools, large amount of compute and large amount of references all wrapped up in a way that really does allow you to do reproducible science. So we're just showing here a screenshot of the landing page with your data processing on the right-hand side, this tool list on the left-hand side and an interactive little window in the middle. Just to give you some context for those people that don't know about Galaxy, uh, as an Australian wide service, not a state based service, it's been in operation since 2018. And that's when we really coalesced uh, pockets of regional funding into a national funding and, and really championed this as the national service for mature life science analytics. I will show you some graphs in a minute, but what we know from our users, which is uh, over 15,000 at the moment. Uh, they're running larger and larger jobs and they're running more of those concurrently. So we're really seeing the service being utilised heavily. Uh, they're also requesting more and more tools and workflows be made available through the service, which of 
is fantastic. It's not just a platform for short read and it's not just a platform for small genomes. It can do long read, long genomes, proteomics, metabolomics, and, and an increasingly range of analytical options. We know our users are using uh, reference data sets of which we make hundreds of those available, um, all public ones, NCDI, NBN, Genome Arc, uh, Gen uh, Cancer Atlas, etc. And one of the services I'll show in a minute is about how we've enabled uh, data to come in and out more streamlined. In response to all these increased activities, uh, we've not been idle. Uh, we've deployed over the last year or two increasingly large resources um, and most recently at NCI and PAUSI. We have brought online some high memory nodes for really any job that needs them, uh, but genome assembly and long read assembly would be one of those styles of jobs. We've deployed a training infrastructure, which will be of interest for those of you that want to learn more about how to do uh, your bioinformatics services or run training events for your group or teams. And through the Australian Biocommons, we engage heavily with uh, communities of practice around the country to make sure that uh, Galaxy is delivering the tools that people need. So just some self-justifying graphs. Here we are in early 2019 with less than 5,000 users. We started a year before that with even less, and we've just been tracking very nicely upwards and upwards to where we are now, which is I think 15,000 user cuts off a few months ago. And that parallels nicely with the number of jobs those users are running. And what's almost satisfying, but a bit scary for me is, you know, we passed our one millionth job in February last year, our two millionth job in February this year, our three millionth job in only September, and we're on track for our four millionth job uh, scaling down again. So we're really seeing a rapid growth in the number of jobs people are running. Uh, I did mention data in and data out. And uh, one of the things that I um, hope people are aware of, but if you're not, I'm, I'm thrilled to be making you aware of it. Arnet, our Australian research network, uh, has a cloud storage service uh, called Cloud Store. Again, on the topic of free, free to you. Um, each researcher in Australia is entitled to one terabyte of data storage on Cloud Store, and that can be scaled up and down at an institute level as well. So uh, last year and earlier this year, we built functionality into Galaxy, shown on the left-hand side of the screen here, is Cloud Store from remote files or on the right-hand side, send data. So you can now bring data into Galaxy or send data back to Cloud Store using interfaces. And this means that you're not bound, bound to your own computer to store your, your large, you know, hi fi BAM files. You're not bound to an external hard drive. You can move them all through um, cloud services in Australia and importantly, secure cloud services that are backed up and redundant, which is almost always more than the external hard drive that we all have plugged into our machines. In terms of the deployment, this is it's just a bit of grandiose, but yes, we're at PAUSI, Arnet, Melbourne University, thanks to Melbourne Bioinformatics, NCI, QCIF, and UQ. So when you want to run a job, it is run in one of these blue locations around Australia based on a, a number of details, but it means that we can really scale up the number of jobs we run at any one time. I'm not going to go into detail for the next few slides, but one of the questions often we get is sort of, how well is Galaxy resourced? So we're very proud of this tool, which has been built in the last uh, month or so. It's a meta scheduler that allows us to more effectively send your jobs around the country so that they end up on the best compute for the tool and data set size you want. And really most importantly for you, the least active of those computes so that your job comes back to you as results as quickly as possible. So that's laying groundwork and lots of arm waving, quite frankly, for the service. What I wanted to do before we go into the next section of, of today's workshop is really show some of this by example. Um, and the example I wanted to use, uh, I'd already put in the Zoom chat just before, is we're really thrilled uh, in the last 
few months, and in fact, including into this week, to be bringing on our high memory slash high versatility nodes. So they have a huge number of 256 CPU, four terabytes of RAM, and some really fast NVMe local storage to allow high rig write functionality. And we've been putting these to the test uh, for genome assembly. At a very high level, we're making use of the BPA data portal to ingest those CCS reads uh, into Galaxy. And as I've said before, we've been doing this for the genome of Australian plants, Ozark and the threatened species. And if you do want to go and see, there's a, a nice news article on the Biocommon website about the, the plant assembly. In terms of Galaxy, uh, I showed just a screen grab before and you know, talked about tools, but Galaxy really gets its power from workflows. And yes, we have SnakeMake, we have Nextflow, and these are excellent products. And we're not saying that we replace these, we're complementary to this style of activity, but being a graphical user interface service, our workflow design is not surprisingly graphical where each tool is specified mm -hmm. as a box with linker activity between the output of one tool and the input of the next tool. And you can get a visual representation of the workflow you're taking. In this case, input from the BPA data portal, file conversion, assembly use PyFi ASM, and as many of the previous speakers have mentioned, the uh, post-assembly QC and metrics. So the Busco, the Clost, Merrill, Mercury, and a whole heap of bandage graphs. And this is just one of the workflows that we have set up for genome assembly. What does it get us? Well, I didn't want to steal Carolyn's talk, basically. So you have to wait for the next talk to see what we've managed to do with these results. Um, but again, as I chatted before in the Zoom chat, what we're really thrilled about is using those high memory nodes to bring uh, a genome assembly of a eukaryotic organism down to about two hours on our machines, which we uh, were really happy with because again, rapid user feedback on their results and allow them to iterate through the tools and tool settings to get the best quality genome out. Uh, so in my last few slides, I uh, wanted to mention the other features of Galaxy that we're really quite keen on. And one of those is interactive tools. Uh, there's a list here and it's growing. We've just added some people sell RNA-seq interactive tools. And the take home message really is if you have an RShiny app or a Singularity container, uh, it can be made available in Galaxy to really take your analysis from what might be a more fixed GUI interface where we provide you with the settings for the tools to a much more interactive environment. So you have a fully functioning R Studio, a fully functioning Jupyter Lab inside Galaxy to allow you to manipulate your data, to produce more complex graphs, et cetera, visualize bands, VCFs, and so on and so forth. And the final few slides, what I wanted to mention is Galaxy Australia is not an isolated entity. In fact, we're very proud and happy to be part of a global Galaxy community at Galaxy Project with, with large partner organisations at Galaxy Europe and Galaxy Main in America. And one of those activities is training. So uh, we all appreciate that entering into a new field of bioinformatics or a new field of analysis can be a daunting experience. So the Galaxy Training Network, and again, I can put the link in the Zoom chat in a minute or just Google it, provides nearly 200 tutorials in all these topics uh, to allow you to uh, get a foothold and an understanding of how to process these style of data or this piece of biology on Galaxy. They come fully supported with data, workflows, primary references, time estimates, videos if required. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful resource uh, to self-educate yourself on a piece of biology. And if you wanted to take it that step further, uh, I did mention earlier trends in infrastructure. So for those of you that are the bioinformatician in a group or in your institute and you're interested in upskilling your own people, uh, Galaxy offers is what we call the TS service, which is effectively a dedicated computational queue 
for your workshop participants so they get their results uh, even faster on the day that you're doing the event. Uh, you get a live dashboard of their tool progress and uh, tool usage. So uh, basically in this uh, you know, post-COVID Zoom world, uh, you can see which people are stalled, which people might have had error issues, and you can really dynamically work with your student or attendee cohort. So it's a great resource and please do get us in contact with us if you want to utilise that uh, to upskill your members. So in summary, at a high level, uh, things I haven't said before, if there's not a tool on Galaxy Australia, and we have about one and a half thousand of them, we do actually have a global tool shed of over 8,000 tools. So uh, hopefully what you want to do uh, will already be available for Galaxy and is an easy install. In terms of service and robustness, it has been in over 15 years of constant global operation and well-funded within Australia. You can build exceptionally complex workflows, which I don't have time to showcase today. Um, but they also now come with reporting, so an auto-generated report of the most relevant results out of that workflow. You can bring quite rich red metadata in with your data to allow you again to complexly interact with your data. And uh, one of the subtle but important features of the service is we do actually provide hundreds of reference genomes, which have all been pre-computed uh, at an index level to allow you to do the most rapid analysis you can. With that, I guess we'll leave you uh, not so humbly that Galaxy Australia is a critical piece of digital research infrastructure in Australia and, and globally. And in many ways, that's no better showcased in two recent uh, sorry, Nature publications within the last two months, uh, both citing Galaxy Project and specifically Galaxy Australia, one for uh, the monitoring and use of Galaxy for uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 analysis, and the other one just about uh, where Galaxy fits within the ecosystem of workflow management tools. So please do come and use us at usegalaxy.org.au, register with your academic account and uh, get in touch with us if you need any support. With that, I'll thank uh, our ever-increasing team for delivering this service to Australia and all our funding and collaborative partners at the bottom of the screen there. And I'll throw back to David for any uh, quick questions we may have. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, just have a look to see if there's any questions coming up in the chat. Um, Gareth, I, I have a just a quick question um, sure. for you. So you, you showed a chart early on showing you know, enormous growth in the use of Galaxy. Um, how do you feel that um, uh, Australia is keeping up with that demand? I mean, you've obviously just put on some more infrastructure recently, um, which is incredible times with uh, Hi-Fi ASM. Um, is Australia going to be able to keep up though as this demand increases? Uh I think the short answer is yes. Um, I could, could be flippant and say that uh, success breeds success and our relationship with our national infrastructure partners is very productive and they want their infrastructure to be utilised. And one way they can see that happen is make it available through Galaxy. So yes, that's a very productive interaction. At the same time, David, yeah, we recognise that. And one of our active discussions at the moment is uh, how to deploy Galaxy onto commercial cloud to really give us access to some particular infrastructure. So at the moment, we're, we're hot to trot for GPUs for some kinds of analyses. And uh, so we're looking to deploy Galaxy on commercial. And the final answer to that is uh, the same demands we're seeing in Australia, we're seeing globally. And there's now an active discussion about how can we share that distributed compute that I shared around Australia but share that compute globally so that um, all researchers essentially globally benefit from every bit of idle compute time that's available. Right, right. Um, a new question has just come in uh, relates to what if you're uh, uh, not an Australian scientist or maybe you're not a researcher per se, can you access Galaxy? What options are available there? Uh, yes. So yes and yes is the answer. So um, what I would encourage at a high level depending on what country you're from, is to see if there's a Galaxy hosted in your own country. It just 
simply limits the amount of data movement time you'll experience. However, all the use Galaxy services, and you'll find that there are a number of those globally, we're all dedicated to open science. We want to foster collaboration between researchers. So yes, any non-Australian scientist, uh, someone with no affiliation, a school student, a community scientist can all get on and use the service. Um, so please do. Excellent. All right, thanks, Gareth. Uh, we'll leave it there. My pleasure. Thanks for an excellent talk. Um, we'll move on to our, our final speaker for today. Um, uh, that is uh, Dr. Carolyn Hogg. Um, Carolyn has been working um, on the conservation of threatened species. Um, she's done that for over 25 years in Australia and overseas. She's a senior research manager of the Australian Wildlife Genomics Group at the Facility of Science at the University of Sydney. Um, she's been working with the Save the Tasmanian Devil program for the past 10 years, in addition to other species such as orange-bellied parrots, koalas, bilbies and whirlies. She is passionate to create a conservation legacy for Australia by changing the way we integrate science, management and policy uh, to promote species resilience. Uh, she is a key researcher involved in a number of BioPlatforms Australia initiatives uh, to sequence Australian wildlife. Um, she's built up a lot of practical experiences with working with PacBioData. Um, and hopefully today she's gonna to share some of her hands-on experiences with PacBioData from the perspective of a conservation scientist. So, over to you, Carolyn. You're muted, Carolyn. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, you would think after all this time on Zoom, <laughs> I would get that right. Thanks for having me, David. Um, apologies in advance for people who've seen the first part of this talk um, already, but I thought I would just give everyone a quick uh, whirlwind tour of what the Threatened Species Initiative is and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so before I start today, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge um, the Indigenous uh, owners of the land on which we all meet today uh, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So for anyone who has been living under a rock uh, or not lived through the bushfires of 2019-2020, we now find ourselves in a, a massive um, crisis, not only in relation to climate change, but really in relation to biodiversity. Um, biodiversity is starting to crash quite significantly at a global scale. And there's really three pillars to biodiversity, um, and that's diversity of ecosystems, diversity of uh, species, and also diversity of genes. And so one of the other things that's come about with, with a lot of the commentary around the biodiversity crisis is really about conservation in the age of genomics. And so more recently, there's been a couple of publications and reviews and, and perspective pieces that have come out about why and how we can use um, genomics and genomic technology uh, for be better conservation um, management and, and policy action and practice. Um, however, one thing I will say is having a genome uh, is not conservation. But once you have the genome, the power of that genome for being able to develop new tools and apply those tools to conservation management decisions is quite extensive. So what we did um, is if you look at the IUCN red list, so this is what designates species to be threatened that's critically uh, endangered, endangered or vulnerable at a global level. There's about 15 and a half thousand animal species currently listed as threatened by the IUCN. And in 2018, when we did this original analysis, less than 1% of those species did in fact have a reference genome. I'm very pleased to say that only three years later, uh, that number has started to increase to about two and a half percent. And a lot of the speakers today have talked about having high molecular weight DNA um, and also having trios available to do these really high quality reference genomes. And really, I'm here to, today to tell you uh, the difficulties that arise when we work with threatened species in the conservation space when it comes particularly to sample quality and being able to uh, generate these ultimately um, platinum standard, really high quality reference genomes and, uh, and what HiFi has done um, to help us kind of bridge that gap. So one of the things about genomes and conservation is they've always been traditionally considered as a nice to have. And so a couple of years ago, before we set up the Threatened Species Initiative, which is about generating genomic resources for Australia's threatened species, 
we uh, I spent a Sunday reading the 200 national vertebrate recovery plans for, for Australia's threatened species. And what you find is that about 85% of those plans have a genetic action or some form of genetic activity uh, that will help the recovery of those species. But unfortunately, less than about 15% of um, those programs are in fact using genetic um, data. And so what we find is that, you know, there's this bit of a gap and it's not because conservation managers know that genetic diversity is important. Um, they know that there's a relationship between genetic diversity and inbreeding, that you know, the more diversity a species has, the greater chance it has um, for adapting to future change. And it also helps individuals maintain fitness to ensure their long-term survival. But what we came to realise is we ended up with this gap. And on one side of the gap sits the genome biologists and the geneticists, and I would argue these days that this is actually a three-way gap uh, where you've got geneticists and genome biologists sitting on one side of the gap. And on the other side of the gap, you have the ecologists, the conservation managers, the practitioners and the policy makers. And the third part of the gap is the bioinformaticians. Um, and so what we found is that with this gap, if we can bridge it, this is really key to helping us lowering extinction rates. Um, and the reason for that is, is because genetics does provide an exceedingly powerful tool that can answer a suite of different questions and really provide information about uh, the long-term sustainability and viability, particularly of very small fragmented populations. So for populations that become very small and fragmented over time, inbreeding accumulates quite uh, quickly. And you, although you naturally have genetic drift. Genetic drift is not enough to keep up with the increasing breeding um, levels. And as inbreeding accumulates, we start to see a reduction in fecundity and breeding rates, and then slowly but surely the population goes extinct. And so this is really where the Threatened Species Initiative um, has been designed to come in. It's been designed to try and bridge the gap between um, what we do with genomes and genome production and, and what the information that can be used later on down the line. And so uh, this partnership was established between myself here at Sydney University, Kim Otterwell over in the West Australian government, uh, Peter Latch, who works for the federal government, um, and Bioplatforms Australia. And as I said, it's about developing genomic resources for our threatened species, but not only developing genomes, but also providing associated population data uh, for different populations. It's not designed to generate data, all the data that a species needs, but really to help um, conservation managers partner better with academics in relation to the species, give some funding to kickstart the species, um, and then also show them all the different types of online infrastructure that exist uh, in Australia to help support them in their analysis. And uh, part of that is we're actually a building an applied conservation genomics portal, um, which is being designed specifically for conservation managers. So Gareth has showed you um, the Galaxy Australia website today, which is absolutely fantastic, and we use it within our research group. But this is more for the other side of the coin. Once people actually get their information back and the genomes being produced, how do they then use that reference genome to align, say, their DART or their DDRAD or reduce representation sequencing? How do they use that information to develop e DNA markers, those kinds of things? So once you have a reference genome, uh, reference genomes allow us to do a, a multitude of different things. And so we can look at just neutral diversity, which is commonly used now with reduced representation sequencing methods using a variety of different SNPs. And we can use it to look at differences between populations, population diversity and structure. We can do parentage analysis. We can use it for phylogenetic analysis. But we can also use the reference genome to start to characterize different um, gene families. So if we can look at immune gene diversity in relationship to disease resistance and recovery of, um, of, from a disease. Reproductive gene diversity allows us to assess fecundity. We can look at the heat tolerance and heat shock to genes in relation to climate and climate change. And so we can actually develop a suite of more targeted marker sets um, based on the reference genome, which is much easier than the old days where we used to have to do a suite of different cloning uh, in order to identify each of the genes. And so really it's exponentially improved our ability to assess what's happening, not only at a neutral level, but at a functional level. And lastly, we can also do primary design. As I said, we can look for species specific eDNA markers, uh, that with the new hi-fi data, we can also run, uh, you can actually, um, there's a new method that's coming out that you can use to look for mitogenome assembly from the hi-fi data. So that will help looking for some of the eDNA markers. And as I said, we can also do specific gene markers for target capture as well as mass array. 
So what we've done with the Threatened Species Initiative is it started in May 2020. Uh, we're currently looking at about 62 different species across 40 projects. And as you can see, there's quite a, a breakdown across critically endangered, endangered and invulnerable species um, across the range of taxa that we're doing. We're also doing a couple of extinct in the wild species. Uh, so these are species that no longer live in the wild, um, but are housed in large enclosures. And um, we're trying to work out ways to best translocate them back and try to get them back into the environment. And DD stands for data deficient. So for a lot of taxa such as uh, invertebrates, um, there are there's just not information. And, and without information, they can't even allocate whether or not the species is threatened. And so we're going to use genetics and genomic data to help inform how to manage those species moving forward. And as you can see, we have a range of taxa. Uh, we have, do have a large number of plants. Um, and this breakdown of taxa with the species that we're using for, the, for TSI is really kind of indicative of um, the threatened species that we have here in Australia. So in Australia, there's about 700 threatened species of animal species, but there's about 1,500 plant species which are classed as threatened. If we look at it, uh, really is a national consortium. We have about 120 collaborators um, across all the different taxa. And as you can see, um, there's quite a large proportion of them come from government agencies. So these are all the conservation managers and practitioners who are making decisions um, in addition to the conservation organisations such as Bush Heritage and the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. And then just over uh, a third of um, the collaborators actually come from academia. And so what we're trying to do is foster better partnerships between academics um, and, and the conservation managers who need the information to help make the decisions. And as you can see, we're doing taxa um, all around Australia and over on Christmas Island as well. Um, and the large proportion of species we're doing in um, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland is because we have also received funding from the bushfire um, funds that have come in back uh, as a result of a lot of species losing um, habitat during the fires. So this is just a quick glance at some of the species that we have. Uh, lots of small critters, lots of critically endangered or endangered species. And so this now leads me to the complexities of trying to generate genomes for uh, critically endangered species. So what we've done with TSI, with our reference genome component, is we've made the decision uh, as a group to really just focus on getting packed by hi fi data. Um, for the reference genomes. There are a couple of genomes where we need to do a limited short read before we do the hi-fi. Uh, and that's simply because we have absolutely no idea of um, how big or how small the genome size is, which makes it very difficult when I contact David um, up at AGRF in Queensland and, and ask him to run a genome um, with no idea what the genome size is. So we have no idea of how many smart cells we use. Uh, once we get the genome data back, we either assemble with IPA or HiFi ASM. But after watching the talk today, I think we'll be focusing more on HiFi ASM. And we use uh, a suite of online infrastructure, either commercial cloud with AWS or, or Aussie or Galaxy Australia um, through the Australian BioCommons. Uh, one of the other key things is the funding doesn't cover the high C component of the genomes. And so we do encourage everybody who's doing the HiFi sequencing through TSI to actually um, make plans to archive their tissue storage for high C or seek other funding to um, get a high C genome uh, generated as well. And then also we uh, promote the annotations. We do transcriptomes, usually up between three to four transcriptomes on alumina sequencing. And, and we're actually assembling that with FGNESH um, using a global transcriptome on the PAUSI infrastructure at the moment. So with the little time left I have today, I just wanted to run you through some of our uh, key species we've been working on. So this is the Krumbit tinker frog. Uh, Krumbit tinker frogs are kind of cute, but they uh, only exist in one remaining population up in Queensland, just north of Brisbane. There's in fact only three adults in captivity, although they do have a number of tadpoles they've been trying to breed in captivity to start a captive breeding population. Uh, this area was heavily impacted by fires. Um, back in 2019, 2020. And they think there's about 300 adults in the wild, but really they have no idea. And so part of this is to build a reference genome so that we can then uh, generate species specific eDNA markers. So uh, the teams can go out and test the stream water to try and find out where the, the frogs are actually found in the wild. Um, the frog is only 25 millimetres long when it's an adult, so it's not that big at all. Um, and they're not much smaller actually when they're a tadpole. So this is the tadpole that we use for our reference genome. Um, you can imagine uh, with such a critically endangered population with so few adults left anywhere, uh, there was 
a really high reticent from anyone to euthanize a frog simply for a reference genome. So this is where um, the likelihood of doing a trio is just never going to happen. So we ended up with a two centimetre tadpole. We were quite excited. Uh, we actually got some non-endangered species tadpoles to test the extraction method was because we only had two tadpoles that we could use uh, for the study and, and we wanted to make sure we could optimise the samples that we had. So this is the first extraction we did uh, with the tadpole. Uh, this is a non-endangered tadpole species. Um, and as you can see, the DNA is pretty black. I sent that photo to David and he asked me if there was anything I could do to clean it up. And so began the worldwide search of anyone else who's done tadpoles, um, discovered nobody else uses tadpoles for amphibian genome assembly because um, everyone just euthanizes an adult. Um, but that probably explains why there are no threatened species frog genomes anywhere in the world at this point in time. Uh, so what we then went ahead and did is we sat in the lab, that's Elspeth McLennan who works with me, uh, under a dissecting microscope and I managed to skin a two centimetre tadpole under a dissecting microscope and get rid of the skin that had all the dirty pigment in it um, and then running the circulomics kit we managed to actually get 45 um, micrograms of DNA. So we're pretty excited about this. Um, and also, you know, I think it's been a bit stressful for the ADRF team up at PacBio because they know the value of the sample and we really, for this species, only have one shot at getting this genome to work. Um, and as I said, one of the other critical problems we have um, is we just don't know the size of the genome. So with the Krumbit tinker frog, uh, we didn't know the size of the genome, so we did some short read sequencing and we think it's about um, 1.9 gigabases. The Corroboree frog, which is the yellow and black frog you can see in the bottom of the screen, uh, Vertebrate Genome Project over in the um, US is currently doing that frog. They thought the genome was about six gigabases in size and I heard a rumor the other day that they actually now think it's about 10. Uh, up in the top right-hand corner is the Bellagio River snapping turtle. This is another really critically endangered species, had lost about 95% of its population during a massive disease event about 10 years ago. And they're now breeding up the turtles up at Taronga uh, Zoo and down at Symbio Wildlife Park. And again, we had no idea. If we go to the literature, a range of the turtle genomes that have already been done at a global level, uh, genome sizes vary from one and a half gigabases all the way up to five. Um, and then, of course, is the bilby, uh, and that's the one I'm going to talk about today. We did high-fi sequencing with bilby, and um, we estimated it to be around 3.1 gigabases because that's the size of most marsupial genomes. Uh, we only ended up doing two smart cells, and it turns out it's actually a 3.7 gigabase genome. So one of the great things, though, uh, we have found, of course, is the difference between the short read draft assemblies and, and hi-fi reads. It really is allowing us to develop these quite significantly complete genomes, even without the high C data, and has really assisted our, our research group specialises in immunogenetics. And so we study um, the immune genes, and those are very complex, difficult regions which cannot be um, automatically annotated for any of the annotation pipelines. So we tend to have to manually annotate them. And the long read data really helps um, move through those complex gene regions and assists us with, with that type of annotation and analysis. So this is uh, some raw data for some of the different species. So going uh, left to right, we have the bilby, the woylie, uh, the wombat, which is not done with hi-fi, um, but that's just for a comparison. Uh, the orange belly parrot, a critically endangered parrot, which got down to only 20 individuals in the wild. It's now up to about 65 individuals in the wild. Uh, Bellagia River snapping turtle and the primitive tinker frog. And, and so these are really a work in progress. Um, the bilby is probably our gold standard platinum genome we're producing using hi-fi. Data. We also had a 10x genome from uh, the female originally, and, and we've used that to polish some of the high fi data and, and generate um, with the high C genome. And as you can see by the stats, like the, the high fi genomes are pretty good, giving us very, very good results. And so um, we've been really pleased with the quality of the genomes that, that we're actually producing. So I said at the beginning, having a genome doesn't do anything for conservation. And so I wanted to give you an indication of what you can do once you have a high quality reference genome um, in order to, um, to then apply those tools to conservation. 
So uh, we've been running the Bilby Genome Project for about four years now, working very closely with the Indigenous Rangers, as well as um, a suite of the conservation agencies like AWC and, and the zoo community who actually house buildings behind fences. And so the Yalara or the Lesser Bilby actually went extinct in the 1960s. It used to be very found up through the, the sandy desert regions through Australia. Um, and we now no longer have that species around. Where the Ninu is uh, the greater bilby, uh, we call it the Ninu. It has a multitude of different names and they've uh, had a range reduction of over 80% uh, since Europeans arrived here in Australia. Um, Ninu are culturally highly significant to a number of different Aboriginal nations. Um, they use them, they used to use them historically as uh, a food source, but also uh, the tails used to have uh, very important um, uh, facts in relation to marriage and, and love in, in indigenous, indigenous communities. And so this is exampled by the multitude of different names that bilbies actually get called um, across regional Australia. So um, the, we used genomics for the management of the Ninu. They came into captivity in 1985. Um, they live behind a range of different zoos in fenced enclosures and even on island sites to protect them from um, invasive species predators. And there was a range of management questions from all the different management agencies about how different or how similar the populations are, how should they be managing the bilbies, how do they compare to populations in the wild, um, are they uniquely adapted to the arid and temperate climates that they live in, is this going to be a problem for translocations. And so um, this is Team Bilby, uh, some of the, it's, it's a large project from a huge number of collaborators across the country um, and actually even in the US as well. We've been managed to also resequence uh, 12 Ninu genomes. So we have the high fi high C reference genome now. We've um, realigned all the resequenced genomes to that and started to do a comparison between temperate and arid regions. Uh, we're finding some very unique results, particularly in some of the lipid metabolism, uh, which will help inform how we uh, translocate and move, move buildings around into the future. Uh, in relation to that as well, we've also managed to resequence four Yalara uh, lesser bilby genomes, and those samples were collected between 1895 and 1931. And as you can imagine, the quality of those genomes is, is somewhat less um, than the more uh, contemporary Ninu samples. However, we have aligned those Yalara samples against the reference genome as well. In addition to that, we have about 335 individuals uh, that we've done, done reduced representation sequencing or DART sequencing, uh, 10 from the wild. It's very, very hard to get tissue samples from wild bilbies. Um, that's because you've generally got to run them down with a hoop net. They don't tend to like traps that much. Um, but we also have it from all the locations where you find bilbies on islands behind fences and zoos. And so we are being able to now compare those populations and show the differences um, and start to help um, managers make better decisions about where they should be sourcing animals from for different translocations. Uh, and lastly, the uh, community ranges that we work with um, in the Indigenous communities are very interested in collecting scat samples. So these are the Indigenous ranges from the Kirikura community that we work, out, work with um, out in the Pilbara and Western Australia. Their community sits on the border between uh, Western Australia and the Northern Territory, and they're really keen to understand whether or not their management practices and their fire regimes um, out in the area are actually helping improve gene flow between the four different building populations that they know exist around their communities. So really, um, the age of genomics is here. Uh, and, and today we've heard a lot about hi-fi sequencing and how we can assemble it and make these really high quality genomes. And I just wanted to give you a bit of a taste for what we could actually do with that genomic information once we receive it. So as I said, biodiversity is underpinned by the three pillars uh, in diversity of ecosystems in species, as well as the diversity of genes. And now that we have um, cheap sequ cheaper sequencing, uh, for genomes and lots of uh, online tools and ways like Galaxy Australia to be able to assemble them really efficiently and quickly. We're now hopefully going to start accelerating the number of reference genomes that we're generating for particularly threatened species across the world. So that's what the Threatened Species Initiative is for. We've got the three different ways we're going to apply the information and really what we've discovered is it's about $25,000 to $30,000 investment per species. Uh, that's including sequencing, extractions and labour, and that will allow us to ge generate at least a hi-fi genome and some population genomic data and really kickstart off a suite of species mm -hmm. from invertebrates through to some of the lesser um, studied frogs and, uh, and reptiles, as well as some of the birds. 
So um, there's a wide range of applications once you, you've got your reference genome um, for management and policy, as well as just studying fundamental biology and ecology. And one of my conservation partners once said to me that having genetic data available for management of a threatened species is really the difference for them between flying blind or flying with a navigation system. So TSI is not just me, it's a, a massive initiative across the country with lots of partners um, from universities, government agencies, zoos, museums, uh, and of course, um, a shout out to all the tech guys who really stepped up to help us figure out ways that we can uh, get genome assembly and annotation happening really rapidly and allow us to turn some of these samples around. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the team of the Australasian World Life Genomics Group here at the University of Sydney, because uh, without them, these are the, the people who work in the lab and, and definitely step up and try and make things work as best as possible for all the data that I've presented today. So this photo has always uh, filled me with a lot of hope. It was taken in 1968 uh, by Bill Anders and it was the first image ever taken of the earth. And if you think about 1968, when they first took this image, there was no internet. Uh, computers took up an entire room, genome sequencing was something in people's imagination. Um, and, and you think about now where we are, we've got artificial intelligence and machine learning and we can you know, sequence a genome in a week type scenario. So for everyone who works on genomes out there and wants to know how their genome assemblies and technology can contribute, think about what the world will look like 50 years from now. Um, because in the 50 years since this photo was first taken, we've had 350 species go extinct. And I would like to see that over the next 50 years, we can use um, this high-end technology to really inform and change the way we make decisions um, for conservation species. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's an excellent talk. Um, we have had some questions come through while you've been um, presenting. Um, uh, Megan asks, um, uh, sorry, Al Alamendra asks, do you consider, have you considered doing flow cytometry to know the size of your genome before sequencing? Um, yeah, that has been um, mentioned to us as well. Um, that's not something we technically tend to do. We just tend to um, do some bit of a short read sequence because then we can also use that short read data to polish the genome if we need to. And I know with HiFi, you're not supposed to need um, short read data to polish a genome. But as you know, David, some yeah. of our DNA is uh, not optimal, even though we flash freeze our samples and do our very best to maintain the quality of the samples. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we do need. So that's that's the reason we've chosen to actually produce the short read data rather than flow cytometry. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess a more, more general question for you. Um, what what goes into this decision making process to select a species to get you know a hi-fi genome generated what what kinds of things do you take into account um so we put out a, an expression for interest call uh at the end of actually it'll come out in november um and people apply to us in um usually february march and, and what we ask for is we really are looking in the threatened species initiative for a partnership with a conservation manager so if we're going to invest in generating a genome um we want to know what you're going to do for it so it's not for for us it's not about just generating the books to put on the shelf in the library, but it's, um, you know, generating the book, putting it, not even ever putting it on the shelf and then handing it to somebody and showing them how to read it. And so really that's why um, that's some of the criteria that are really critical to our project, but like OZARG, uh, which is another BPA project, they really trying to generate um, genomic resources to resolve the um, phylogeny and taxonomy of a huge number of Australia's reptiles and amphibians because there's some species which are not actually species, they, they are a different species and people class them as the same species but two different populations and from right. a management point of view that's a huge headache so that's it really depends what the focus of the program is but they, they're also using high five um, sequencing as well. Excellent. Uh, Zue asks, um, have you considered using PacBio IsoSeq for genome annotation? Uh, we do use PacBio IsoSeq for um, MHC regions. So MHC is the major histobatable, I can never say, histobatability yeah. <laughs> complex. You think by now as I work in immune genes, I could say it fast, but I can't. 
Um, so one of our team has actually just developed an ISO-seq method to do that entire, we can get the entire MHC1 gene region now um, in one go with PacBio, which is amazing. And it's definitely made one one in our lab a very happy person because she is the person that usually has to manually annotate it. Um, I think we'll be moving more into ISO-seq. To be honest, a lot of the issues we have for wildlife is, is simply cost. Um, I know that the cost of sequencing has come down dramatically, particularly if you do human research. But um, the reason, you know, there's, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of species that just can't afford to even, you know, pay $15,000 to get a yeah. reference genome. So um, that's a reality for us all the time is the balance between, you know, input DNA, sample quality that we've got available, um, what we require for the sequencing and really at the end of the day, how much money we've got to spend. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. That, that's excellent. Um, I, I think what we might do now is to open up questions for the entire panel. Um, so if you've got any questions, you can, um, to anyone who's spoken today that you've been burning to ask, you can open up. I, I thought what we might try, and Karen, um, let me know if this is possible. If we could, if someone raised their hand, uh, we could allow them to actually directly ask the, the question. Um, to a panelist. Um, so if anyone has a burning question um, that hasn't been already answered, I know many of them have been already sort of answered as we're going along, um, you can put your hand up and you can ask directly. See how we go there. I think many of the questions were answered as we're going. Oh, here we go. We've got one. Uh, Sabrina Nolan. So hopefully, yep. Uh, hello. Um, I've spoken to many of you already. Uh, as you know that I'm doing the sequencing of the jellyfish genome. And not only are we planning on doing HiFi, ISOSeq, we're also planning on doing OmniC, but um, I heard that TRIO sequencing would be better than OmniC. I was wondering what's the difference between the two and why did he say one was better than the other exactly, if someone could answer that. Um, maybe uh, Heng Lee, would you like to, to tackle that? Yeah, one? I think uh, so far, I think um, sometimes this, uh, high C, it's more challenging to do the, the high, high C phasing mode because it's uh, more challenging competitive problems. And so I think in our assembly, I think we have seen a still a bit more, I mean, error rate, a higher error rate. I mean, if, if you, you, you are facing with high C. And the, another issue is actually the sex chromosomes. If you, I mean, for, for human, if I say single male, because the X, chromosome X and chromosome Y are not, are not the same. And actually this will, will cause some facing, facing problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I say, but if you know the chromosome Y and Chromosome X and Y very well. I mean, if you know the sequence very well, you can, I mean, do a manual curation basically to separate them later. But if you just do, rely on automated pipeline and it sometimes it may mix them together. Yeah, we don't know. I don't think, um, so with jellyfish, I don't think they know the difference between the female and the male chromosome or like how it's arranged. So, so if that's the case, that might mean that the trio sequencing would be better if we don't know the different sex types between. Yeah, yes, with the trio, your separation is cleaner because you have the, the parents and you, you, with the parents, you can completely separate the, 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 the condition the data sets. Okay. Yeah. Sabrina, the other thing as well is um, if you have, you know, one of each sex, you can actually reconstruct the different sex chromosomes if you've got high C um, and high fi data you actually just subtract the smaller chromosome away from the, um, the, the heterogametic sex away from the homogametic sex. Um, and we did that with uh, antichinus. So yeah, get in touch and I can um, put you into the person who can help you with that if you like. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you. And actually, an important point. Um, actually, if you want to do chromosome uh, scaffolding, I mean, you have to use, use high C anyway. And so it's, uh, uh, but uh, yeah. With base trail, you can't do scaffolding. Yeah, I, I imagine the uh, the other thing to consider is that you 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 have to go and sequence um, three individuals. So, 
Yeah. And that would so, ideally be the mother, the father, and the progeny, is what you mean. Mm, don't know if that. Yes, which is possible. why we don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that would be possible for my end. Yes, <laughs> but um, trio um, trio um, analysis only works if you have the animals in a zoo and you can get mm -hmm. genomic samples from both parents and the offspring, um, which is why it's commonly done in common species, but it's not done in. Um, species that are not held in captivity or um, like wild samples you can't you can't do it from indeed okay so in this case um it would be better for me to because these are animals caught out in the wild so i don't and they were given to me so i don't know the sex i also um don't know who the parents are so obviously it would be the best case for me yes okay thank you so much all right. Do we have anyone else who'd like to um, raise their hand? Got another question they might want to ask? Um, uh, Almendra. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for the presentations. Those are wonderful and very informative. I'm very new on all this dynamics and assembly and all this bioinformatics stuff. And I'm going to be um, doing some genome assembly for a rust fungus. Uh, my question, which is really general, it's uh, where can I like send my genome when I or my DNA when it's already extracted. I'm from Peru, but now I'm living in Fort Collins, Colorado, USA. So I was thinking, where can I send my genome for the pack bio sequencing? Sorry, where, where are you based again? I'm now in Fort Collins, Colorado, USA. Right. So one possible answer there might be Maryland genomics. Maryland genomics. Yeah. Big genome center there. Ideally, um, you, you do want to look for someone somewhat close to where you are physically placed because um, you ideally want to keep your DNA as intact as possible and shipping can be a possible place where you can introduce some damage to your DNA. So. Um, yeah, Maryland might be a, a great option. Okay, thank you. And also another general question. Usually, uh, do you like open kind of training positions for people who is new and would like to learn this bioinformatics stuff, like in presence? <laughs> um, well, maybe Gareth could answer that. He's actually listed a whole heap of um, resources uh, that are available there. Thank you, David. And Yes, so um, again, I will put my one trick pony on and encourage you to go to usegalaxy.org and I'll drop that into the chat in a minute and the training portal. And the short answer is yes, there's twice yearly live online training events and most of your local Galaxy instances will offer local training. So I'll drop all those information into the chat in the next minute or two. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions coming in? Anything else we might want to cover? Just give people a um, I have another question. Sure. So the HiFi is something, is a, the assembly platform that has really been emphasized to be used. Um, I know that each, um, each assembly uh, platform is different in terms of how like the commands to give, are there any trainings or like information on how to use it on GitHub or would you have to speak to someone who's used it before? Um, if you know, like the, the script, the structure of the script to run or tell it what to do um, as well as the certain commands uh, that it requires. Um, yeah, so, Sabrina, there's, um, there's documentation on Black Commons for IPA mm -hmm. and I know that because we, our team wrote it. <laughs> For them when we did it and then uh, we've been working really closely with Gareth in the last few 
probably over a month and a half now, just Galaxy Australia, um, and he's got an awesome workflow. So we can now hand it over to a PhD student um, and they are pretty much starting to run their assemblies by themselves. And there's lots of um, documentation through Galaxy Australia as well for the Hi-Fi ASM, which is on Galaxy and IPA. Um, IPA, you have to generally set up yourself. We do it on Pausey, but um, you're up at UQ, so you probably do it at QSIF. Or, um, David was saying today they are yeah. going to be doing IPA through AGRF. So, yeah, um, yeah there's, there's quite a few options there. For you. Um, I, I think if you're uh, another option, if you just wanted to run Hi Fi ASM at a command line, I'm, I've come across a, uh, a post from Hang Lee. Lee's lab, they've got a, a tutorial of how to use that from just a direct command line. There, there's a lot of resources out there. Okay. David, could I share my screen for a second? Sure. If that's all right. Um, so uh, I think we, one of the things I like to recognize that is Galaxy is a mature platform, but it is also, I see it as a gateway bioinformatics tool to command line. So once a tool is successfully completed, this is a successful completion of a hi fi. ASM assembly. So I'll just zoom in for people on different screens. I'll zoom in ridiculous. Uh, you actually are presented in the tool information, all the tool settings, all the files, you're actually presented with where it's run, but you can get full access to the command line infrastructure mm. that was in use. So the syntax of the tool is actually buried in Galaxy. And this is, can be really helpful for people that want to transition from the GUI to command line or just want to learn the command line. So for Hi-Fi, I think as multiple speakers have said, the input's relatively simple, but for some tools, it can be quite complex. So this is a great way, uh, I think, to learn that command line syntax is just to run the tool once in Galaxy. We hope you stay there, but if you want to do it on command line, here's how it's run. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, do we have any other questions? Any last questions coming through? Um, all right. Well, um, if there's no, yeah, if there's no other questions, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers today um, for their excellent talks. Um, thanks to Karen for actually managing this session um, and, and all the other people behind the scenes making sure this this um, uh, this workshop goes off uh, well. Uh, thanks to Pack Bio and Millennium for supporting this workshop. Um, there's a quick reminder that there is another workshop on genome annotation planned next week. Um, and uh, just thank you all for joining into this workshop. Thank you. Thank you.